admittedly, Jimmy Cook, it feels like it's been forever since we've been here in studio, right? It does. After a week at the Combine. I guess it's been a week. Kind of forget. forget. Did you forget what I looked like? (laughs) Oh, no. Believe you me. Did you miss this face? Hard as I tried, I did not. So you didn't miss this face, huh? Oh, of course. Of oh, course. How sweet of you. Uh, good afternoon to you on a Monday that's supposed to be spectacular outside. My name is Jake Query. Jimmy Cook here as well. That is Eddie Garrison. Eddie is the CEO of the company here at Querying Company. Jimmy Cook, the president of the company. And we gather each and every day from noon until 3 o'clock talking about the world of sports, opining on it, and trying to incorporate you, the listener, as well. That's what we do. And I begin today, all of that to say, as we reconvene, that's good news. As the weather has turned and broken a little bit towards spring, that's better news. It's supposed to be in the 70s today. That's the best news. I don't want to be the rain on the parade here. But I have concerns. Jimmy, I have a growing concern. We have been in this town, we have a history in this town of Buying in too early. We have a history in this town of being so eager to find something to rally behind that we realize that we coronate relationships too early. We Like we go out on two dates with an athlete and they're nice to us and they say the right things and bat their eyes and we're like, we are on our way to Jared. Let's go. Right? And I don't think that, matter of fact, I know that's not the case in terms of a bad marriage with Tyrese Halliburton. I know that. And I think he probably is simply in, I'll call it a slump. But I do think that in the case of Tyrese Halliburton, what we are seeing right now, one would only assume is the effect perhaps of the injury of the possibility that Tyrese Halliburton wanting to make sure that he got the correct number of games to make like all NBA performer or get the contract necessary for the supermax to kick in or whatever the, the, the clause is that would pay him more money. Maybe he rushed back. And as a result, his play now has suffered to the point where it might dip him back out of that possibility. But Tyrese Halliburton went over from three-point range in back-to-back games. In addition to that, he is now 9 of 41. I looked this up last night. He's hit nine three-point shots nine times. Nine, nine times? Nine times he's made a three out of 41 attempts since the All-Star game. Is that good? He hit 10 threes in the All-Star game. Is that good? It's 21.9% according to the math of Eddie Garrison. Right? Yeah. So, the bottom line is when Halliburton is playing at that level, you know, Siakam now is their most most consistent performer. I think it's probably some sort of an effect from the injury or just like, I don't know if it's a psychological slump. I don't know what's going on. And for right now, I'm simply going to point it towards this guy is in a mini slump. But there is area for concern, Jimmy, simply because you start to look at it and you go, wait a minute. We've seen, I've seen this movie before where we, Danny Granger, thought a guy was like the new franchise player and then like just things didn't go well around him. When we, Paul George, thought a guy was the franchise guy and then external forces got into play and suddenly they weren't. When we, Victor Oladipo, saw a guy that we thought was the franchise player and then starts listening to the wrong things and going in the wrong direction. I don't think any of those are applicable to Tyrese Halliburton, but I'm concerned. I don't think any of those directly reflect Tyrese Halliburton, but I have worry. And that game last night, watching it, it, San Antonio's not a great team. Got a great player, though. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Victor Wembanyama is a joy to watch. You want to see, if you're a fan of the NBA, things be built right around him. He's a very good player. But, yes, the Spurs as a whole, that was their 13th win. They're not you know, as bad as, say, 
Detroit, but they're not great. And it was a opponent that you played earlier in the season that you absolutely just slaughtered. And I know things change. These teams have changed. But last night, despite how bad things were for the Pacers, I was watching the game waiting for the Halliburton run to finally break through, whether it was from assists or whether it was shots finally to start falling for him. Because that's the other thing for me, Jake. It's only two games in the month, but it would be his lowest month easily in terms of assists per game that he's had all year. Three against the Pelicans and Grant, that was only in 23 minutes, and eight against the Spurs. So it's not just the shooting is down, which 0 for 12 the last two games is brutal, but it's the assist numbers haven't been there as well to the point that it's not just, oh, maybe his shot's off. It's either A, he's in a slump as a whole for his game, or I'm kind of right there with you. Maybe it is still lingering stuff from the injury pre-All-Star break. How about TJ McConnell, by the way? Ever since you pointed it out, I mean, I'd seen it, but ever since you have pointed out the TJ McConnell signature months ago, by the way, but the drive and then just to circle with the basketball, like just a stroll in the park. And then he's uh, either going to pull up for a jumper. He's going to find somebody open. He literally else. like lulls teams to sleep. Yep. He does that drive and he starts, he starts going around the baseline and then he comes around and then he looks, he's either going to hit like a nine foot jumper or he's going to do another lap. And then before you know it, you're just like, wait, uh, like which way did he go? Like, <laughs> exactly. like where'd he go? Right. You exactly. just lose him. Right. Yeah. But bottom line, if, T.J. McConnell, and thank goodness he was there last night, even though they didn't win. But if T.J. McConnell's giving you 26, it, it probably it means that there's something elsewhere that's gone wrong, right? Yeah, you'd like that. I mean, I'm not going to criticize, nor are you, clearly, a T.J. McConnell 26-point performance off the bench. But that sweet spot is more when he's getting, like, 15 off the bench, and there's other guys in the starting lineup, primarily Tyrese Halliburton, that are getting theirs and scoring at a high level and passing at a high level. It is now, though, for me, Jake, we've entered the phase where my one thing I wanted from this team since they traded for Pascal Siakam was to have everybody fully healthy. And I I don't know if Tyrese Halliburton is or not, if he's still playing hurt or if he is fully healthy. But this is now the beginning of that stretch where against the Pelicans, you get Neesmith back, and now you have what your lineup is the rest of the year. This is your lineup that you're going to take with you to – when you make it there, the playoffs, and whether you're part of the play-in or the playoffs, this is your roster. How does it look playing together as a cohesive unit? And, man, it would be wildly unfortunate, both from decisions that have to be made for Rick Carlisle as he is fine-tuning the lineup the rest of the way, as well as for the consumer if it's a lull right now for Tyrese Halliburton that extends five, six, seven games. We're only at two or three right now. But if that's where it gets to, we're kind of being robbed of what this team's final form is going to look like because Siakam's doing his job, as you outlined. He is the clear heartbeat right now offensively for this team. Here's a great perspective somebody sent me. Jake, this is the effect of Tyrese Halliburton's birthday. He only gets to celebrate it every four <laughs> years, so what do you think happened? They <laughs> were great. in New Orleans. That's good. That's good. The stuff. entire Bourbon team Street. was with them. Okay, that's fair. How did Bourbon Street let a six-year-old that, in? That's what that's, I want to know. What are I we mean, doing? Come that's on. fair, right? Uh, meanwhile, in college basketball, congratulations to the Boilermakers of Purdue. No big surprise here that Purdue wins the Big Ten. But, look, they have been so effective and so good that it's almost like we just go, yeah, okay, whatever. They won the Big Ten again. They've won it four times, what, since 2017? I, I mean, come on. Now, my mom sends me the following text. And this is why you've got to love both Purdue and my mom. Okay, my mom sends me the following text of, uh, hi, Jake, it's mom. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Uh, Purdue just won the Big Ten Championship, right? There was no storming the floor. I said, well, yeah, mom, they did win it, but they're used to it. They did it last year. They did it, you know, obviously in 2017. They did it in 2019. So they're used to it. She writes back. They and Now, let me let me interject. (laughs) My mom did attend Indiana. We grew up an IU family. My mom bought IU stuff for me every year of my life between the ages of like probably four and 20. But she replies, they are very mannerly. I love Purdue with a little basketball emoji. (laughs) So from now on, when we refer to the Purdue Boilermakers, I think we need to refer to them as the mannerly Purdue Boilermakers, right? Yes. 
I thought you were going to say Mrs. Query's team, but that's fine too. That's I couldn't true. help but notice on that screenshot you tweeted out with those messages, it was mom sells. So do you have mom burner in the uh, Rolodex no. of context too? Good question. I'd like to know this. What, what, I don't know why I have sell necessarily in there. Although, because I have for my parents' landline, because I, I still have a landline, it just says mom and dad. But what do you have for those that are, that are fortunate enough? I mean, I realize I'm very, very fortunate that, that have your parents' cell numbers in your phone. How do you have it labeled, Eddie? Mom? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree, right? Like, I know some people that have their parents' name in the phone, they have it labeled as their parents' like actual name. Like like me putting in the phone like Karen Query. No, it's it's mom, right? My dad every once in a while will re- will refer to my mom to me by my mom's name. You know, Jake, Karen, and I were at the mall. You said, "Dad, that's my dad. That's my mom." You can say <laughs> you say mom, right? My parents are still married. I'm like, you, you can say mom. It's fine. But at any rate, um, my mom did send me that. But for Purdue, you know, beating Michigan State now and a chance to get the outright Big Ten title when they close against Illinois. There's not much more you can say about Purdue that. We haven't said a million times, right? They, and this is what Purdue has done really well. And it's not always an easy thing to do. And it's what we have to hope for Tyrese Halliburton, for example. And that is that when Purdue has had moments or or slight stretches where they're not totally cohesive, they've righted the ship fairly quickly and gotten back on the horse in the right way. Fletcher Lawyer, for example, Jimmy, there were concerns voiced even on this radio program about whether or not Fletcher Lawyer was kind of dipping into the Fletcher Lawyer that has cost Purdue some games late in the season last year. And he's he got back into rhythm. It's like they managed to kind of keep things afloat until he got back in rhythm. And now it looks like, again, one game does not a, a season or a stretch make. But they look to be back in sync again and in good position to be able to, again, get back and secure a number one overall seed in the tournament, and then you see what happens. In regards to Fletcher Lawyer, players across the board at any level are allowed to have slumps or stretches where perhaps you have cause for concern. He has put those to bed. You hope that those type of things, regardless of the player, just don't happen in the postseason. Well, it goes without saying, but it's worth at least mentioning in that regard that slumps happen. Tyrese Halliburton, I hope it's just a slump. I hope it's not a larger issue or a continuation from a previous injury. I hope he's just in a rough stretch post-All-Star break and he'll snap out of it here in a couple of games. In regards to Purdue, when they take care of the basketball, nine turnovers. When they have high-scoring outputs from Zach Eady, 32 points. When they are clean from beyond the arc, 50%, 10 triples. Nobody's beating that team. It's not happening. They're too good. If you cannot turn them over, if you cannot slow down their offense from beyond the arc, and if Zach Eadie's going to drop a 30-burger on you, give them the Final Four banner now. Punch their tickets to Phoenix because they're not getting stopped. That is the only way, and we talk about this with any like near-perfect team. That's why they've only been beaten three times this year. You have to cause one of those areas to flounder, and rarely has that been the case for Purdue. So they, like you mentioned, Jake, what else do you talk about with Purdue? Well, you talk about what you do with every other great team. They have checklists they want to achieve. Go win the first trophy you can, like they did out in Maui. Okay. Go dominate the Big Ten regular season. Win a regular season title. Okay. Go win the Big Ten conference championship in the tournament. Okay. And then your sights are set for a trip all the way to Phoenix and potentially hoisting a national championship trophy. All things considered, in my mind, they are right on schedule with where they're supposed to be and continue to respond to any challenges thrown in their face. By the way, if you were going to go to Phoenix for the Final Four, would you take a train or a plane or a bus? You'd fly, right? Yeah. Because I agree with you. Everybody says punch the ticket, but isn't that what they do on a train? They don't punch your ticket anymore on a flight, right? Like you scan your phone, right? You know that I actually worked – we can go scan their ticket from now you know, on. Like I'm down four... to start that as a trend. <laughs> They've scanned like, their ticket to the Final Four. I'm all for it. That's right, right? They downloaded their <laughs> they downloaded their their seat. Like four years ago, I worked on the IndyCar Radio Network with somebody who still didn't have like a, a, 
I don't mean like the mobile aspect of, of the phone. I get you know that that those things. I get it, but didn't know that you could like go online to like check in for a flight. And we'd get to the airport like after a race. We'd like rush to the airport, <laughs> and there was one member, no names mentioned. There was one member of the radio network that would be like, "Guys, we got to get there earlier." Like, look at the line at the check in counter. I'm like, "What?" <laughs> like, you don't have your boarding pass? No, I gotta I gotta go in there and check in for my boarding pass. Like. Whoa. What decade are you living in? Anyway, see, I, I still check in mobily, but every now and again, I still like the good feeling of the physical board. I get pass. it. That you would mean tra- I won't check in. You I'll would just travel go back well. The- you would travel well with Shannon P. Walsh. Yeah, Shannon, she, she big, she big. Got to have the physical documentation. Is, like, no, no, no. We like I got to check a bag. I got no, no, no. Shannon, you don't trust me on this one. You don't. I changed, like, I absolutely changed the world. I've changed the world many times. I changed her world. We went to Vegas because I convinced her to take a carry-on bag because usually for a two-day trip, she's got 75 pounds worth of stuff. And I'm like, no, 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 just do a carry-on bag. You don't have to check your bag. And when we got to the airport and didn't have to go to baggage claim, she's like, oh, my gosh, this is the greatest <laughs> feeling of liberation of all time. Like, yeah, we're the same outfit for three days. Who cares, right? Uh, Indiana was on the road yesterday. Speaking of which, I don't know if they took a train or a plane. I'm assuming a plane. Don Fisher will join us in a few and we can get that answer. I know the answer they flew. But um, look, I, I'll give Indiana credit, man, because this is a team that we have knocked, we have badgered, we have critiqued, we've mocked in addition to knocked. And when it came down to it, Xavier Johnson made big plays for them down the stretch. They found themselves down 16 in the second half. And yet, and and they had, same thing in Columbus. They had a big deficit. And both times, they find it within themselves to claw and come back. Khalil Ware, again, plays at a very high level. McKenzie and Baco starting to show something. And I don't know if that's good or bad for Indiana fans because – it's good for Indiana right now that McKenzie Mbako is coming back and scoring, you know, 24 yesterday, shooting the ball well and creating offensively that's helping them win games. But you also wonder if he's not showcasing that for the possibility of playing somewhere next year elsewhere than Indiana. And I don't mean that because I have no reason to believe he doesn't like Indiana, but he was thought of initially as like a one and done player as it was and kind of didn't get things going. People know the potential that is there. It's a dry draft. Does this tempt him now to test the waters and for Indiana to be like back to square one? But we'll talk about that and more with Don Fisher because it was a gritty performance for Indiana. And then one other thing in basketball yesterday that happened, and I'm curious about this. Jimmy, I'm curious about this. I was concerned about Tyrese Halliburton, but I'm curious about this point. Over the weekend, Caitlin Clark passed Pete Maravich for the all-time NCAA scoring record. And I don't think that anybody thinks that that means that she's a better scorer than Pete Maravich. I don't think anybody thinks that means she's a better player. I just think, to me, it is not a comparison or even an inclusion. It simply is a barometer. Hey, Caitlin Clark scored a ton of points in college, and she's the all-time leading scorer in women's college basketball history. Wow, like I know that you know Pete Maravich averaged like 44 a game. I wonder how it compares. Actually, she scored more points than Maravich in her career. And, of course, when you look at it, you go, well, Maravich only got to play three years, though. I simply offered the following post on X. I'm getting hip with the kids now instead of saying tweet. Yesterday, I said the following, quote, Maravich got one less season and no three-point line. But Clark has taken 600 fewer shots. Clark would lose 503 points without a three-point line. She hit 503 threes so far. But if she got an extra 600 shots at her 46.6% score or shooting clip, then she would have an additional 560 points. It's not as lopsided as detractors say. That's it. I had no idea. Maybe I should apologize for this. I had no idea this was like some triggering, polarizing political debate for some people. It was insane. I mean, people are like, you're crazy. You you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I don't see her out there playing against men and she'd get destroyed in the NBA. And I'm like, did I say any of that? I'm simply saying 
that if people, in terms of comparing the statistics to one another, if people want to use the barometer of the availability of which to acquire said statistics by simply saying advantage Maravich because he played in fewer games, I'm saying there are also mathematical factors going into it that favor her. And it balances out in the end one way or the other. Yeah, but one plays with a smaller ball and it's the rim's the same size for her and she's not going against six eight guys. I, I, I get all that. I mean, I, I'm not compa- I'm not saying that Caitlin Clark is a better player than Pistol Pete. Somebody else like, are you saying that she'd average 10 a game in the NBA? What? No. I'm simply saying Pete Maravich, I did not see play. You know, he, he was obviously before I was born – but I know of him. My when I was a little little kid, I remember my dad always saying to me, "Hey, you're Pistol Pete." That was just the nickname, right? You're Pistol Pete, and like, and I certainly knew of the magic wizardry of Pete Maravich. And the one thing that I always heard about Pete Maravich when I was a kid growing up was that Maravich was so far ahead of his time that his assist statistics were probably skewed because of the fact that he threw so many passes where his teammates weren't even prepared for it because they'd never seen anything like the wizardry of the ball handling and the court vision of a Pete Maravich. So to me, it's a credit to Pete Maravich that his name is being brought up in this statistical comparison because it provides the perspective to people as to the astronomical number of points that Caitlin Clark has accumulated because, my goodness, if she could accumulate the number of points that Pete Maravich did, that's really something. Because Pete Maravich has been known as a phenomenal player and scorer. Now, with all of that said, you know, Maravich, granted, also was known as a high-volume shooter. And the coach favored him shooting the ball a lot. Advantage Maravich. I I don't think anybody is, is looking at this as some sort of a demerit to Maravich, but rather the ultimate compliment to him. And furthermore... Maravich's record for the all-time scorer amongst men in NCAA basketball is far and away the safer record because until the WNBA gets to a point where they are drafting players at the age of 19 or 20 and giving them $20 million up front, in Maravich's case, anybody that is scoring at the kind of clip that could eclipse Pete Maravich is gone by at the most their sophomore year. Nobody's going to play four years if they're scoring at that level. Do you think the vitriol would have gone away if this was Caitlin Clark breaking Mike Davis's son's record? I think there would have been a lot more vitriol if, if <laughs> yes, if, you know, if, if Antoine you recall, Davis. We no. did this last year like because it was the Correct. extra year it, and, it, and he's shooting 40 shots a game. There is no doubt about this. If Antoine Davis, if Antoine Davis had broken the record, that's a that's even a more fair comparison because playing for his dad, offense running exclusively through him, Allowed to take a billion shots, but he also got because of COVID. Right, he got an extra year. I right. mean, he got so he had two extra right. years, right? Right. So, two, yes. Yeah. There is no doubt that that if I'm just if, making light of Antoine all of this, right? Davis, who most people in Indiana know Antoine Davis still to this day as the adorable kid on Mike Davis's shoulder, you know, in his arms when they went to the Final Four in 2002. But if Antoine Davis had broken the record of Pete Maravich. There is no doubt that it would be like Barry Bonds. Like, you ask 100 people on the street right now, who's the all-time home run king in baseball? Uh, 90% of people instinctively still, and maybe this is my age, but but a lot of people still instinctively say, Hank Aaron, well, no, it's Barry Bonds. I mean, like almost – Aaron Judge. When I was a kid growing up, <laughs> when I was a kid growing up, the absolute – the number that every sports fan knew, everyone knew 756. Right. Everyone. And everybody knew 715. You ask most people right now to name Barry Bonds' home run total and give them a, a plus minus of five with inaccuracy? Yeah. I, I don't even know. what uh, Eddie, what is it? Do you know top of your head? Uh, I do not. It's like 760. I want to say like 763. I was going to say 768. I I have no idea. Paris, do you know? Jimmy? That's you, you 782. Get my, you get my point, right? Yeah. 762. So, I was what close. What is it? 762. Okay. Sorry. Closest without going over. We're both wrong. But okay. My, you didn't, my point you didn't being, say that. 
My Price point being, rules. instinctively, still people think of Hank Aaron, and I think that if if Antoine Davis had surpassed that record, I think people still would instinctively say right. Maravich. And in Caitlin Clark's case, I don't think anybody is trying to take anything away from him. It just gives a good barometer, no. which is the ultimate compliment to me. It's people you know I mean? with, it's people with a complex that feel like things are trying to be taken away from him. Nobody's trying to undercut what one of the greatest college players on the male side did because the greatest female player on the college side has now surpassed him. That's not what's happening. You can honor both, and you can tip the cap to what has just been an outstanding career from Caitlin Clark. Yeah, great player, right? Yeah. Great player, and one that I think people will be, as we know, as you know, because we talked about it, I think people will be excited to see her play. Um, and I actually, I have contemplated this. I didn't end up pulling the trigger, but I did talk to somebody with a fever over the weekend about getting a half season season tickets to be able to give away to like girls groups in the city. Um, but the tickets that are remaining are pretty rich. I'll say that. So the impact is certainly there. Uh, Indiana yesterday, big impact in Maryland, a big win for the Hoosiers, and one where for the second straight game, they had to kind of dig deep. So we'll put a little barbecue sauce on our crow, and we'll enjoy that. And then Don Fisher will join us on the other side. Happy Monday to you. Query Company here, 93.5, 107.5, The Fan. I'm what you might call a fairy.
Tonight, 7.05, as a matter of fact, on this radio station, you will hear Inside IU Basketball with Mike Woodson along with Don Fisher, and I would assume it's going to be uh, a lighter conversation than we've had uh, over the course of the last month or so because Indiana, for the second straight game, dug deep and pulls out a win, and I have a feeling I know, Don Fisher, what you may answer here. But I was listening to you in the second half yesterday, in particular after Indiana had overcome a 16-point deficit and kind of come roaring back. And there was one player. I thought McKenzie Mbako was really special yesterday. But if you had to pinpoint one area that things have really kind of turned for the better for this team that we didn't see, say, three weeks ago, it would be what? Well, I would say that uh, yesterday especially, but just because of the fact that he's been back for two games now, it was Xavier Johnson. And I say that because um, it just seems like this team has performed better once he's been on the floor. He didn't play great in the Wisconsin game, but he made a couple of shots, a couple of key ones. Um, He turned the ball over way too much, but he was a difference maker at the defensive end of the court. And I said if Indiana was going to win yesterday going into the ball game, I thought that that Xavier had to play uh, a key role in that, and I thought he did, especially in the second half. He shut down Jameer, J- J- Jameer Young for most of that second half. I-, I just thought his play in these two ball games has lifted this team a little bit just from a confidence standpoint or maybe a belief standpoint. But getting him back, I just think, has been huge for this ball club at this point in the season. And, Don, with that, has it kind of allowed – so? You know, it was it's it's been very obvious at different intervals in the year that McKenzie Mbako, for example, I'll use him as the example here, that he's got talent. I mean, there's no doubt that he has a scoring acumen about him. But does having an Xavier Johnson, are you able to see with your vantage point, maybe kind of a a, a more relaxed nature of Mbako when Xavier Johnson's out there that it kind of frees him up a little bit to to just kind of play a little more freely, if you will, and that has allowed Mbako to kind of flourish a little bit. Well, I, you know, I, I just think McKenzie's gotten better. I, I don't know if it's Xavier's uh, presence out there. May, it may have something to do with it. Um, but McKenzie Mbako has gotten better as the year has progressed. He is st- still very not, not near where he needs to be from a defensive standpoint. Uh, you can see that by some of the point at some points that in the ball game that Mike takes him out uh, because he's upset with his defensive play, but his ability and he's changed kind of as the way he's going about his business too on the floor as the season has progressed. He's gotten more aggressive in going to the rim. Uh, you know, when guys close out on him, he, he's not afraid to try to dribble around them. He turns the ball over still a little bit too much. Uh, that's due to the fact that at the college level. Uh, a bigger guy sometimes has that issue with his ball handling, but but he's gotten better as the years progressed. I think he's he's finally a little more comfortable out there on the floor. I think he knows he's got to play if this team is going to be at their best. And I just think the confidence level by all, with all of these guys with X back on the floor has really helped. Voice the Hoosiers, the Hall of Famer Don Fisher is our guest. Don, I don't know about you, but if you would have told me a week or two ago, heck, maybe even a couple days ago, that Khalil had nine points in a ball game, I would have asked you how much Indiana lost by. But they didn't need the big fella <laughs> to go double digits yesterday. He was obviously a massive factor on the glass. But when you look at the game itself, look back on it, and then look at the box score and see that from where, how much of that was just because of, well, you have – and Baco going for 24, you have Xavier Johnson back running things. Trey Galloway gets into double figures. Where did things occur offensively where they did not need another Herculean effort offensively from Clover? Well, I think probably you got to give Coach Woodson and his staff a little bit of credit for this one uh, simply because they didn't they 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 weren't just chucking it inside all day long yesterday. In fact, they they really didn't have a focus on getting the ball inside and down low for all the ball game as they have in many of these games preceding this one. Uh, I think that their whole key in this ball game was pushing the basketball, getting up the floor, uh, uh, being aggressive with their offensive play rather than kind of getting into a half court set every time and trying to slow it down or try to find something and trying to get the ball inside. They weren't trying to get the ball inside a good portion of yesterday's ball game. If you looked at how they play, 
they were aggressive at the offensive end, trying to get kickouts and things like that. And the good news was Indiana was able to knock down those kickouts. Uh, they hit almost 50% of their shots from the three-point yesterday uh, in that matchup with uh, Maryland. They had, uh, an, uh, what was it, 7 of 16, I guess, they knocked down in that contest. Uh, in the ball game preceding it, they hit six threes against Wisconsin. So all of a sudden, they're starting to hit some shots from outside and from different people. I mean, yesterday, Gabe Cups knocks down a three. Uh, Anthony Leal hits one. Uh, and Baco, of course, had four in the ball game. Um, I'm trying to remember somebody else, too, had a three-point field goal. Oh, Xavier. So Johnson has a three. So you had different people hitting these shots. I just think the offense opened up a little bit instead of just trying to bust it inside every time and either have Malik or Khalil knock down a, a little jump hook or a dunk or whatever the case may be. You know, they also, Don, Don Fisher, our guest, they shot the ball well from the free throw line. You might have mentioned that, which is not – I mean, that's been a boogaboo for them for a while now. Um, is it the crab cakes in Maryland? I mean, like, what was the <laughs> – what's going on here, right? All of a sudden it was like, here we go. This is what I expect to see, right? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, free throw shooting is <laughs> – they t they call it free throws for one reason. There's nobody guarding you out there. <laughs> and Indiana has really struggled in that area throughout this season, as everyone knows. It's not been anywhere close to what Indiana is capable of doing, I don't think. But, you know, the results are 66% from the free throw line on the year as a team. <laughs> so, and, and when you look at it and you're looking at whose statistics are pretty good in that area – only Mbaco has knocked down threes at a consistent rate. Anthony Walker doesn't get nearly as many minutes as those other guys. He hits 73%. Everybody else is below that number. and They're all under 60% on the season. So it has been a big bugaboo. And the fact that they were able to have two games in a row where they actually hit free throws at a pretty consistent rate, and they weren't superstars against Wisconsin, but at least they hit – 68 percent or 67 percent of their shots in that ball game that's kind of their average a little above their average so like i said they were better at the free throw line in both of these games they were also better at the three-point line in both of those ball games so those are huge stats for indiana don the reality is this don fisher's our guest over the course of the year um yeah at different intervals maybe sometimes it was I mean, I think for the most part it was warranted because it was never any any sort of personal thing. You know, there's been a lot of critique, including on this radio program, of Mike Woodson. I'm not saying by you, but just, you know, that, that about the preparation of the team and what we saw from the outside. But one area where I'm going to give a lot of credit here, and I want you to expand on it, there was a lot of discussion, and you and I talked about it, Don, at the beginning of the year, that you were really intrigued by what Khalil Ware could do because he was a big-time recruit when he went to Oregon – there was a lot of expectation, but the knock on him was that he wasn't always totally invested in the course of a game. I think this guy, in particular, in a year where things were starting to go south there, for the most part, has put in really good effort. And I would assume that it is the coaching staff that is able to light that fire within him. Can you expand a little bit just on the way that Khalil Ware has played? And I guess the kudos and the credit that should go to Mike Woodson seemingly for being able to awaken that in him. I don't think there's any question. If there's one thing you can say, that Khalil Ware has gotten better and better as the year has, has gone forth. He has always been a skilled basketball player. The question or the knock on him was how hard he would play or how motivated he was to play hard, those kinds of things. And honestly, you can only look at maybe a handful at best of ball games this year where he hasn't lived up to expectations in that regard of being better in that area. Uh, I really, I mean, I, I look at his performances, the games that he hasn't necessarily played his best. He's gone up against a big like Edie. Um, um, I'm trying to remember the, the big uh, player that they had for uh, Connecticut back in the early part of the season was another guy that he had problems with. Um, most of the time when he's not scoring the basketball at the level of which we've seen most of the season have been because somebody else was uh, significantly either a better player than he was at this point in his career or, or that they double teamed so much that he had no opportunities, but it hasn't been because of playing hard or working hard. Yeah. He looks a little bit like he's kind of gliding sometimes down the floor, but he's also seven foot or seven foot one, whatever he is. He's got that long, incredible stride 
Um, and it doesn't look like he's working that hard. But actually, I think he works very hard out there. I, I have to give kudos to Mike Woodson and to the rest of the coaching staff for getting this guy to play hard and to be motivated to do so. And he certainly looked that looked the part in that regard most of this season. Don, I know this will be a better question next week once you see this team two more times before the Big Ten tournament arrives. But in this two-game sample size, does this look like a group? And I, I can't believe I'm asking this, but it's just where things have turned in two games. <laughs> Does this look like a group that's capable of a deep run in a tournament that they, historically speaking, have not had a ton of success for, even though underneath Mike Woodson, they have? You you know you're talking to a guy that has not broadcast the Big Ten Tournament Championship in his history. <laughs> I do know that, yes. You I do, realize I do that, know right? that. That's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> We're living dangerous, Don. <laughs> so how many times has Indiana been beaten in the very first game that they played in the Big Ten Tournament? It is I don't even want to, go, want to go there. It's it's embarrassing. But the fact of the matter is, this is not that. I mean, it's like the Bob Knight curse. He never wanted to have a Big Ten tournament, <laughs> and Indiana <laughs> never won the daggone thing. So all I can tell you is I'm just hoping that they can possibly win these next two ball games, keep themselves out of that Wednesday date that nobody wants to play in, and then maybe give themselves a chance to win a couple of ball games in the tournament because – at this juncture, I think their NCAA tournament hopes are shot. I think because of that net or whatever they call it, uh, they are so low in that. I mean, guys like teams like Ohio State and some of those teams have a much better net than Indiana does. So right now, they've got to be playing right now to finish this season strong. Obviously, to make a run of the Big Ten tournament would be special in that regard. If they could win these two ball games, now think about this: if they could win these two ball games and win the first two games that they play in the Big Ten tournament, they would win twenty games this season. Would you think that back about three weeks ago? Oh no, no question. Yeah, no. Or form? no. <laughs> so, so right now we're, we're just hoping for the best to end this season. And let's face it: these two games that they have coming up are going to be very tough. I mean, Minnesota has played and gotten better as the year has progressed. Uh, they have a couple of guys that have really played well for them. I think they may have the freshman of the year and that Cam Christie kid because he is he is really up, up his game since they played Indiana the first time, and he's been tough all year long. And I think there's the other guy that you have to worry about in this ball game is Elijah Hawkins. He's a terrific player at the point guard position. He, he really is the head of the snake in that ball club. Uh, I think this is going to be a challenge. And then you've got Michigan State coming up. And, you know, the Spartans under Tom Izzo have always gotten better at the end of the year. They have not done that this year up to this point. They've been very sporadic on the season. But they have the tools to make a run in the Big Ten tournament. So neither one of these upcoming games this week is, is going to be easy or by any stretch of the imagination a game that you could count in the win column. So it's going to be a test for this Indiana ball club. And maybe the momentum they've gained out of these two ball games this past week will give them exactly what they need. Don, lastly, one thing I know about you, well, I mean, there's a lot. You've been doing games for IU for a long time. But I know that, or I assume that you are a fan of history, notably American history. I think you're a pretty patriotic guy. A lot of people don't realize University of Maryland, I think, is kind of suburban D.C., you would be the most fun person ever to like go through DC with and go to the different museums, the different presidential sites, historical sites. Do you get a chance to do that at all? Or are you guys pretty much in and out? Uh, we are almost always in and out, but we, uh, during the football season, uh, several years ago, uh, we were, we had a chance to be there. For, I think we were there for like three or four days. It may have been when they had the, uh, no, I can't remember. It wasn't basketball related. It was football because Buck Sewer, my color analyst, was with us. And we did. We toured uh, the monuments. Uh, we went to a couple of the museums um, and just got a look at what Washington, D.C. was all about because I'd never taken a tour of it myself. We literally walked that particular day probably oh, six or eight hours totally, worth yeah. of walking and just took in so many of the sites uh, – uh, the memorial, uh, World War II Memorial, all those kinds of things. It was really, really cool. And, it, Don, it's one of those things when you do it, uh, you know, everything from the Vietnam Wall to the, you know, all the memorials like you mentioned. Yep. It, it If you didn't have it before, and I, I can't imagine somebody wouldn't, but if you didn't have it before, when at the end of the day, you have a totally new appreciation. Even if you had it before, your level of appreciation – of being able to be an American goes up tenfold after you go through all of those things and realize everything 
that's gone into to who we are now. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'm very, I, I won't give you my political affiliation because I think that just gets you in trouble. <laughs> But I think you, I think you know based on the fact of how I go about my business, and I'm pretty much a guy that uh, believes in this country, always has. I don't think we're in good shape right now, but hopefully we get better. Don, we appreciate the time as always. Uh, Hoosiers up next. It is. Uh, remind me here. Is it Wednesday night? Uh, a talk show or talking about the game? Well, no, tonight I know it's seven oh five with Mike Woodson, but the next game in terms yeah. of the schedule. Yep. Wednesday night. Wednesday night we play in Minnesota, and believe it or not, it's a 9 o'clock game at Minnesota, which means we'll get back at 3 or 4 in the morning. That just makes my day. Well, Don, then you got to get a cup of coffee or just, just something with you for, for a little pep in the step because I don't know if you've noticed, and I know there's still games to call, but, Don, that weather is getting nice, and those lakes are going to be <laughs> sharp, baby. That's what I'm talking trust, about. Trust me. Uh, I have thought about it immensely over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> With all the sunshine and the warmer temperatures, it's kind of taking me off. <laughs> Starting to line up all the tea times, baby. There we go. Don, we appreciate the time as always. Thanks for having me, guys. See you. Right. Thanks, Don, Don Fisher, the voice of the Indiana Hoosiers, joining us on the program. Again, right as he was saying that, by the way, my headsets fell out. And I'm like, wait a minute. All of a sudden, I was, it was like I was – in outer space, I didn't know what you guys were talking about. I, I had FOMO there, right? You know, not to make him envious, but I was down in Bloomington yesterday, and in the drive-in, there were people with the push golf carts. So they're already out there in Bloomington. They're they are enjoying it, living up the good temperatures and playing some golf. When I was a student at Indiana a billion years ago, I lived – I know I've mentioned this before, but my apartment – I lived in Jackson Heights Apartments – in my apartment, when you walked in, you open the main foyer. There's A, B, C, and D, right? I was in apartment D. The one on the left of me in the lower level was apartment A. And that apartment was Pat Knight and Ryan Carr. Ryan Carr, now the director of – he's the vice president of player development, I believe, for the Pacers, is his title. And Pat Knight, of course, the son of Bob Knight. And I didn't know either of them from Adam, right? But the first day of school, you know, or the first day we move in, it's like, oh, let's go meet the neighbors. And it, it, it immediately becomes Kramer and Seinfeld, right? I mean, we're, <laughs> we're constantly back and forth. To the point where we then – now, I hope – I don't want to get anybody in trouble here. But we actually – the closet, we figured out that the, the coat closet in the apartments, there was a, a small wall between their apartment and our apartment oh, accessible please. via the coat closet, right? Sure. So we we took the whole wall down. Yes. And then we went to White Rabbit on Kirkwood and got love beads, the Greg Brady beads. <laughs> nice. And we hung those, and we took the, the doors down. So we had a, a little hallway that connected both apartments. It's the greatest thing ever. So, like, I, I'd be in my, you know, doing whatever in our apartment. You hear the beads rattle, and you know, like, oh, Pat or Ryan's coming over, or we would go over there. I mean, constantly. Pat had two dogs come back and forth. It was the best. Anybody put the wall back? Oh, yeah, we did. At okay. the end of the year. Okay. So Pat was from Bloomington, obviously. Sure. So he knew a guy that was a drywall guy, ah, okay. and we each threw in 50 bucks or whatever, and the guy came and sealed it back up. And so there was no – so, yeah, we we, we, nice. we had it all taken care of. I mean, so there was nothing totally below board there. But at any rate, one day I'm sitting there, and it was this time of year. It, it, it actually probably was the fall, if I think about it, but it was a nice day out. And I hear the beads, and here comes Pat. Hey, what's up, you know? And he goes, oh, nothing. I'm getting ready to go golfing with my dad. I go, oh, that's cool. And, of course, I grew up the biggest IU fan ever. And I'm like, he's going golfing with Bob Knight. What's his dad, right? So I go, oh, okay. So they leave. He leaves, whatever. And, like, 30 minutes later, here come the beads. And I look up, and there's Pat. I go, what happened? I thought you went golfing. Go, oh, no, we did. <laughs> I go, well, it's your tea time. You said it was at, like, 1 o'clock. It's, like, 1.35. He goes, dude, I kid you not. We got up to the first tee. Everything's fine. You know, both birdie, you know, whatever. Or, you know, He said, we get to the second hole. My dad hits an errand shot, goes in the water, hits his <laughs> second tee shot, goes in the water, picked up his entire bag, <laughs> threw it in the in the water, got in the car and drove off. He goes, so I like, called Laura and she gave me a ride home. I go, okay. And he said, anyway, so what are we doing for dinner? <laughs> it's beautiful. Okay. It's beautiful. Sure. Yeah, it's just the way it went, right? It's simply the way it goes. Um but at any rate, so Indiana, nice win. And, I, again, kudos to them. Xavier Johnson, I'll give him credit. I, you know, when when Indiana needed a guy to step up for them yesterday, he did make big plays for them, and I've been really hard on him. 
you know, you could certainly make the, the case and the argument if you wanted to that at, at this age he should be making plays like that. But all this does is further magnify for me that they need guards next year. And correct. the only place they're coming yeah, from correct. is the portal. So once again, regardless of how this season ends, it is they better hit a home run in the portal. That's it. Well, they put themselves in the position where they have to do that, right? Because because it turns out Mike Woodson was partially right. Maybe he was right that Xavier Johnson and having a – it goes back to having a guard, a, a competent guard, even at times a reckless guard, but a competent guard to be the marionette to this offense. Um, The – NFL Combine is still going on, even though we're not there. Somebody sent me a message over the weekend that said, I was at the Longhorn Steakhouse on East Washington Street, and they sent a picture of one of the prospects in there eating. And they're like, do you know who this is? And I'm like, I don't know, but if you're on the – if you're going to the Combine and you're going to Longhorn Steakhouse by Washington Square for dinner during the NFL Combine, like you probably should at least – at the very least, you're, you play for Texas, right? I mean, what other reason would you have to go to not, – nothing against Longhorn Steakhouse, I like it, but like all the way out like by Washington Square, that's a that's quite the venture away from downtown. But one guy, I guess some fat guy ran like a 4-3-40 and everybody went crazy, right? Yes. And then another guy – now, I saw people saying that somebody ran a 4-2-2 and it was the fastest or, – or Xavier four, Worthy out of Texas, yeah. But Bo Jackson ran a 4-1-3. Are we going with like – Weird Caitlin Clark, Pete Maravich disclaimers at the combine. Well, so he's lit. So <laughs> Bo Jackson though ran a four one three in an NFL pre workout sanctioned by the NFL, but they didn't have the 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 combine as we know it today, right? But still, four one three is a four one three. Yeah, Bo Jackson's the last guy that would actually like want to argue with you about it because he seems like a pretty humble dude. Sure, but maybe I'm just like jaded because I will admit. I've got a man crush on Bo Jackson and always have. That's my it's understandable. That's my like middle school, high school sports phenom hero, and that just never goes away. Mike Chapel joins us, by the way, top of the hour. Got an emergency on the weekend? We're here for Jimmy, I did something over the weekend that I've never done before. Ooh. What about you? What'd you do this weekend? Anything fun? Well, I gave a brief tease about that during our IU conversation. Went down to Bloomington. One of my very good friends, shout out to David Kirkoff. His wife, Kendra Kirkoff, is an assistant coach for IU softball. So went and caught That's an cool. IU softball game yesterday. Won 10 nothing over Valparaiso. How oh, they mercy rule them? They did. Mercy rule them. Did they actually mercy rule? They did. They, they, did they, they really? They beat, they beat them uh, five innings. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. three home runs. Great day. Valpo no longer the Crusaders, right? They're not. They're the Beacons. That's my fault. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, no, you didn't say that. I'm just saying. Did I not say Crusaders? I okay, always, We're Beacons. No, didn't. I always forget. I, I, Beacons just is not that does not naturally roll off the tongue, right? No, it doesn't. You totally forget that they're the Beacons. Uh, Eddie, yourself, weekend highlight. Um, I caught up on sleep. Does that count? That's cool. Nothing wrong with that. That's what weekends are for. I got no problem with that. Um, 
Not that I need to approve your weekend festivities, but so I, I did something on Saturday that I've never done before, and I'm not here to poo poo it, but 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 I have to admit, you went and got brunch. No, I've done that on uh, when I used to work in TV, and I would go into work at like two thirty in the afternoon. I would wake up at like eleven every day because you know you'd get home from work at like one thirty or two right. in the morning, right? So I'd wake up at like eleven in the morning and go. Usually to pat at you at 49th and Penn and get the same thing. All the, I loved it. Um, so it, you ever do something or, or are you ever involved in something where you think to yourself, this is the greatest example right here of just being in a relationship, right? Like the, the give and take of a relationship. Every day in oh, industry yes. on this show. Okay. <laughs> well played. <laughs> so Shannon says to me, oh, my, and, and she's been partaking in this activity for quite some time. And she enjoys it, and I'm like, that's cool. And I listen, I love, like, pedicure, I'm all in. Manicure, definitely all in. Massages, I'm good to go, right? All that. But there's one thing that she does fairly frequently, and her friend, they had, like, bought, I think, like, a, a thing for three people. One of them couldn't go. And I said, well, yeah, sure, I'll go. I'll Is go it try waxing? Huh? Waxing? I've done that on the back uh, – Listen, I got my back waxed once, and I was like, who poured sulfuric acid on my back? <laughs> it, it was the most painful thing ever. I, I, and they were like, well, yes, yeah, so we do have some people that have that reaction after the fact. <laughs> like, yeah, I guess. She put that somewhere in the terms of conditions. I mean, literally, I, I felt like, you know, the superhuman guy that, that jumps on YouTube? You guys sure. ever seen Superhuman? He's the fellow that takes his shirt off and jumps into, like, beds of nails and stuff like that. Maybe I haven't. That's no, what I felt mind. like. At any rate. Orange Theory class. No, good guess. She does that, too. Okay. That, that was Sunday. Okay. This was on Saturday. One more guess. Eddie, you got a guess? I think it's a predominantly female activity. Hold on. Look at me. <laughs> oh, I, I definitely would spray tan. I do that on my own. No, I was looking at the eyebrows. See if you got your eyebrows threaded. I've done that. That hurts, I think. When I go to 459, I just have them take care of the eyebrows. I'm good to go. So she's like, no, no, this is super relaxing. I go, okay. Couples massage. Oh, no, you said and, there was and three. Like, and it's like therapeutic. I'm like, okay. And and years of research show that it's good for you. It, it it helps take care of like all your your breathing. And I'm okay. And then we went, and 10 minutes into it, I looked at my watch, and I said, we got 35 minutes left of this? This is definitely like meditation or something, isn't it? The Salt Cave. Have you been to the Salt Cave? No. Never heard of it. No. Well, there's two ways you could do this. I, I think if you live on the near south side, you can just go to the Salt Barn. It's probably the same thing. The, the Salt Cave is a room <laughs> of probably a little bit bigger than this studio, and there's just salt everywhere. And there's like some... like you know like weird orange lighting in the thing and then little like old school 1970s sun deck chairs laying around they're like uh just pick a chair that's comfortable and then relax and um take in the hamayan salt that will cleanse your lungs and so like i look around and, and it's i mean i'm the only guy in there there's nothing wrong with that i guess but like there's like eight people per session or whatever and it's all these people just sitting around breathing in salt and i'm like what what are we doing here so the benefits were not felt by one Jake Query, is that what you're saying? I, I didn't find it relaxing. The whole time I was just thinking to myself, this was how much? That was going to be my question, too. I don't know if that was prying too Free much. Free for you? <laughs> question mark? <laughs> well, it, well I, I will say, uh, you know. Because she, based on the tone of the voice you gave for the, hey, please sit down, she, I assume <laughs> way too much money. Well, she came in and she's like, in, in 45 minutes, I'll come in and, and let you all out. I'm like, what, are we getting locked in here? What's going on? You know escape what I mean? room. Am I sending, like, smoke signals to people? Like, come and get us. So anyway, I did the salt cave, and afterwards, um, Shannon was like, well, you know, what, what'd you think? And I'm like, uh, thank you. I, I'm glad that you let me experience that, right? They have the pepper chamber afterwards. It's pretty nice. <laughs> it pairs well. Say, she I peppered heard. me with questions, right? That was nothing new. Mike Chappell's next. Plumbing problems stink. The L.D. Smith Group can handle anything. Call today for $50.
Now, I'd like to know this on this Monday, and supposedly it's gorgeous outside, but I don't want to say that and then have it be like rainy outside. Can you look, Jimmy, can you contour yourself towards the window to tell me if it's nice out? It's supposed Would to be like 70 to and sunny, right? Would you like me to go run outside and give you a stats report yeah. on the Monument Circle as if well? you could, because we, we're, we're landlocked here. And I'd like to know if Mike Chappell's landlocked. Is he still at the Combine, or are we done with like being at the Combine? Because the Combine's still going on, right? Chap joins us now from, of course, WXIN and CBS4. Uh, Mike Chappell, the, the NFL Combine is still ongoing. Am I correct in that, or is it? did it wrap up yesterday? I think I thought it wrapped up yesterday. It might still be today. I quit on Friday. Okay. I did, I did my fill, so no, I I plead some my ignorance on that. Okay, I'm I'm going to begin with this, and and I had mentioned this with Kevin on Friday, and I I realize this sounds absurd, but Mike, a couple of years ago, when a player would skip the combine, and when I say skip, I mean not work out or not throw or not do different things. It was it was usually like huge news. And now it almost seems to be like the norm with the upper echelon players. Yeah, they come in for the medical, and maybe they do some interviews with teams, not with the media, and then that's like it. Are we, in fact, starting to see the decline of the importance for the top prospects of the NFL Combine? Well, but like you said, we've always had this. Uh, and and you, you need to have leverage. I mean, a little like Chris Ballard told us with, about Marvin Harrison Jr., there's only so many Marvin Harrison juniors. If you have leverage, I think you do things. Uh, he took it to the, it's really funny. He took it to the extreme this year because he didn't, need media. you know, and that's, I understand people say, well, big deal. Well, everybody talks with the media. This is the first time we can remember a player, you know, showing up. And I think he went through his physical stuff. And then he shined the media for whatever reason. I don't know what the I reason mean, was. I mean, chap, his name is Marvin Harrison Jr. I, well, I know, like, like father, like son. I understand that. <laughs> uh, but then you had Caleb Williams, who didn't do the physical part because he said, "Well, I'm going to go top four, so I'll do it for those guys." Well, you know, that that it is a slippery slope. I don't get concerned about quarterbacks not throwing, receivers not running. This is tailor made to me for a quarterback or a receiver to look bad. You're throwing to guys you don't know. You throw their routes. That's why they much prefer pro days. But when players start not doing, to a lesser degree, the interviews, because all you're doing is screwing the media, which big deal. But when you don't do the medical part because you are the presumed top pick or top three pick, that's different. Will it, will it ever get to where it's a race on this? Probably not, because again, you need to have some juice. But I don't, you know, I understand a player who has leverage using it because 90% of the time teams have the leverage. So when a player has it, use it. The Dean Mike Chapel of Fox 59 and CBS 4 is our guest. Chap, I know you tweeted about this, but. Michael Pittman Jr. might have already gained a little bit of leverage and momentum by not even doing anything as the Tampa Bay Buccaneers re-sign Mike Evans, who many thought would hit the free agent market. They lock him up two years, $52 million, $35 million guaranteed. So the $35 million guaranteed is a big one there. And then a $26 million annual salary over two seasons. Uh, your reaction, elaborating for those that maybe didn't see it on Twitter, on that contract and how, if at all, it impacts Michael Pittman Jr.? Well, what it probably does as far as impacting Pitt, it probably reinforces his idea about what he might get on the open market. I don't know that it's going to, you know, convince Ballard, oh, boy, we need to, I guess we're, we're lowballing. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think the Colts have a number, a number range that they're very, very comfortable with, whatever that is, I don't know. Uh, and if it doesn't work, they franchise him, you know, which is tomorrow the deadline. But, uh, and again, I have to believe, I might have mentioned that last week, I have to believe that, that the Colts have a very good idea that they're in the ballpark with Pittman long term or they're not. I just I just do. Whether or not the, the Evans things, again, I think it only impacts Pittman to say, man, he got he got $26 million over two years, you know, average. Uh, now, whether that, again, increases value to the Colts I don't think so but and it's funny on the comments on my tweet is like 
Well, that's crazy. He's not an upper tier receiver. He's not Michael Mike Evans. Well, no, I'd take Mike Evans because you know Mike Evans is is a notch above. I'm, if that upsets the Pittman camp, I'm sorry, but th- this is about Pittman going into free agency and his value to the Colts. It's kind of like Jonathan Taylor last year. The running back market was what it was, but his value to the Colts was more. So this is sort of a Colts-Pittman issue. And if T. Higgins signs for similar numbers and all this, I just don't think it may, it'll impact the Colts. It'll just maybe have Michael Pittman put his heels in a little bit different, deeper on wanting that long-term deal. And I've always thought, to me, the number that's going to really move the needle is guaranteed money. That's all that matters in the deal. I don't care if it's four years, $120 million. How much money do you get guaranteed? That's that's the that that's what really matters to players. I think that's what, more, more than the average per year. It'll be how much do you get guaranteed, and we'll see where that comes in. Mike, I want to clarify this for our listening audience. Mike Chappell is our guest, um, just so that people understand it. When the Colts – I shouldn't say when, if the Colts franchise tag Michael Pittman, and I'm speaking this for maybe it's a small percentage, but the people listening who are not familiar with these terms, that means that he is bound to them for another year. He would make the average of the top, I believe it's five or 10 highest paid receivers in the league. And that would limit or or restrict his ability to negotiate with other teams. So long as he is franchise tagged. Now question I have for you, to clarify for folks, once they franchise tag Michael Pittman, does that automatically freeze negotiations, or can they lift that tag in agreement for a long-term deal at any point during the period of which he is under the franchise tag? It's uh, Yes, he, he, it's a restrictive thing. It's $21.8 million. It's the top five salaries over the past five years. The exclusive tag is, is five the top five guys this year. But you tag him tomorrow if you can't get a deal done. And then you have until mid-July to do a long-term contract. Yeah. So, in other words, what? a month from now they can say, hey, you know what, we've, we've come to an agreement. He's no longer tagged. He's now a Correct. four-year product or whatever, right? Correct. You can do that until July. Okay. And he does, again, he still does have the opportunity to go out as a non-exclusive tag to, to sign to talk to 31 teams sign an offer sheet with one team, only one offer sheet, and then the Colts have the right to match or get two first-round draft picks in compensation. You know, I've always said I can see a team more than willing, more than willing to sign Pittman to $26 million a year. I just do. But are they willing to get up two first-round draft picks for him? That I, that I don't know. So it, it, it's very restrictive, but the player still has the option, the opportunity – to see what's out there. And I really think Pittman wants to see what will somebody offer. Now, again, if the Colts can just come up with a great offer, then maybe he doesn't. But he told us in January, I owe it to myself to see what the market is. And I think that's what he wants to do. Mike, what did we, if anything, learn from the combine in terms of the first few days whether it be patterns in the league, whether it be prospects that we thought were richer than, you know, in depth at the draft that aren't, you know, whatever it might be, give me something that we might have learned at the combine as it relates to the Indianapolis Colts that we perhaps did not know one week ago. That the receiver group is deeper than what people projected. It was already projected as a deep group. I saw somebody was projecting seven receivers in the first round. That's crazy. That's absolutely crazy. Uh, so, if it, and to take it to the Colts who need a receiver, regardless of Pittman's status, uh, they need a receiver. You know, if, if if it's that much quality at 15, do you take a guy? Or do you say there's so much quality at receiver, there's going to be a pretty good guy at wherever they are in round 245, whatever it is. I wouldn't want to wait because the longer you wait, the less player you get. It's just the fact. So I, I think it's that, man, there, there are a lot of receivers, a lot of guys who may be able to step in and play. The speed, you know, the one guy ran, what was it, a 4 2 one uh, And then remind people that John Ross ran like a 4 2 and he's yet to really 
Well, I was going to say, if you look at the list of like the top 10 combine speeds, you know, it's it's probably it's 50-50, right? It's just like any other factor, right? It's, it, it's Darius Hayward Bay. You yeah. know, you know, maybe, maybe the Rangers will take him in honor of Al Davis. <laughs> but it, it's it's a there that that's a real a strong group is stronger. And again, it's it's all of a sudden J.J. McCarthy had a very good combine by throwing the ball. And th- th- somebody was mentioned in a top ten pick for him, and maybe and maybe six quarterbacks to unround one if Michael Penix gets in there. So, you know, if people need to remember there's only thirty two picks in round one. So okay, seven receivers and six quarterbacks. You know, it's so all of a sudden you're chewing up the first round, but which is great for the Colts. If six quarterbacks go early, you know, the top thirteen picks. That just pushes a really, really quality player, maybe an edge pass rusher, maybe an offensive tackle. We shouldn't be shocked if they take an offensive tackle at 15. I won't be. Uh, I think they need a receiver more. But uh, it, it's we're, we're into the land now where after the combine, all the, the draft experts, some of them that you trust and some of them are just guys in their basement, that are going to start picking apart these players and building players up and who had the best athletic time in numbers and all that. And they're going to start picking apart these quarterbacks at the top and building up Michael Penix, who was considered primarily a second-round pick. I watched J.J. McCarthy play, I don't know, five or six times at Michigan this year. And I just my, – my eyes don't tell me he's a top-20 pick. But how much of that was because of what Michigan asked him to do? That, that's where you really – I'd hate to take a t- guy top 15 and, you know, I think this guy can be pretty good. I, I would like to know more with that type of, a, type, type of a pick. But that's why these guys, the Ballards and all these guys, get paid the big money. they got to make decisions based on what these players did but projecting on what they can do in the next four, five, ten years. Mike, when it comes to – Mike Chappell is our guest. When it comes to the receiver room, I'm going to go back to that discussion real quick. The Colts are drafting pretty much smack dab in the middle of round one, 15, right? So right. so which is a more true statement? The quality of receivers that were in this draft entice you to, to use 15 to take one because – you're getting potentially like a historically immediately impactful receiver at 15 or the depth of the position is such that it affords you the luxury of drafting elsewhere and addressing receiver 40 picks later when you're back on the clock again. I, yeah, I would take the former again. To, and that's, that's the problem is if it's that deep, well, we can get a guy at 45. Yeah, but you're not going to get, the guy, the quality at 45 that you're going to get at 15, and then the question is, well, how much difference is there between the fourth receiver and the eighth receiver, or whatever, whatever the thing is? And you know, these guys have not, these guys have not gone first. They, they've not gone heavy investment on receivers. They've gone second round. You know, Paris Campbell, Alec Pierce, and and, and Pitt, and even Jonathan Taylor second round, but they've not gone. Heavy, heavy, even free agency, which sort of tells you their, how they build rosters and player importance and priorities. But when you got the rookie, when you get in a rookie, when when you've got the young quarterback, you got to have people around. Him. Yesterday, the offensive line, which played well last year, all those guys are coming back, and that's why, like like if Brock Bowers, the tight end, is there at fifteen, man, my goodness. I was here for Dallas Clark and what that guy does for your offense as an extra piece, not even really an extra piece, but as an important piece is, is he better than that third or fourth receiver? I don't know. I don't know, but I would err on the side of giving the quarterback too many options in skill players. I just would, you got Taylor Pittman, you know, Pierce has got a chance to take a big step this year. Josh Downs looks really good. They need help in the tight end room. I wouldn't be the least bit opposed to bringing in a couple receivers or, or a first-round receiver and still a free agent receiver. I just would because they've – they talked. one thing that Chris Ballard talked about is how losing Ashton Doolin to a knee injury and early on set them back. What it did 
but it shouldn't. It, it hurts your special teams, but it shouldn't. You shouldn't losing a player of his caliber, a number four receiver. That shouldn't be a major loss if your room is positioned right. So, yeah, I, the receiver room needs help. And boy, at 15, again, coming out of combine, guys are just gaga over these receivers. If they're that good and a guy that can be that much of a difference maker, you go and get him. And maybe you're getting Reggie. What was Reggie, 30 or 31? Yeah, he was uh, late, late first, drafted. right? Yeah, boy, you you you'd, you'd take Reggie every day. Uh, so I I I'm high on receiver. I'm high on tight end if it's Bowers. I but again, I could argue just as strongly for a offensive tackle. I could argue just as strongly for a corner. Uh, so I, I think they're going to be in really good shape, and we'll really see how they prioritize. And, and what do they what do they address in free agency before the draft gets here to maybe ease? cornerback or ease receiver so they're in a really good position with again cap space and all that so i, I kind of like where they are it'll be very interesting to see what they do with this mike chapel of fox 59 and cbs4 is our guest chap i'm glad you brought up brock bowers because i mean he's definitely the crown jewel at tight end in this draft and in a lot of mocks which again are just tools they don't mean that's actually how the board's going to fall but in a lot of those he is in the colts range right at 15. When, I know it's lying season, but when you look at Chris Ballard's comments at the combine regarding tight end, it's clear he still has a lot of belief in that room, whether it's Will Mallory, whether he wants to look at Johnny Woods not being healthy, Mally Cox, Kylan Granson, the list goes on. There's a lot of good guys that do things solid, but not at the level that Bowers could be a do-it-all tight end. From his comments, is it lying season? Is he not giving away the goods or do you really feel like he feels that strongly about his tight end room compared to what they could have if Bowers was there at 15? Well, he also said, we don't have that Kelsey guy. He did say that. You're right. I mean, not, not Kelsey, but that type of player. Elite elite tight end. Guy. Right. Yeah. They've got, they've got a very good group of complimentary tight end. This guy does this, this guy does that, but they just don't have a, a, a feature guy. Now, you know, injuries were a problem in, in Guys would have a good game and then they'd disappear. Giovanni Woods, you just don't know. You just, you know, Shane Steichen doesn't know what he's got in Giovanni Woods because he's not been on the field. Uh, I think if they could get that guy in, Bowers would, would improve the room exponentially. He just would. Now, he's not going to be a great blocker, which is fine. Dallas Clark couldn't block much. <laughs> and he was a pretty darn good tight end for four or five, six years. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, and again, they're, 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 Ballard's pretty good about not lying, but not telling you the whole truth, which is that's 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 a very good talent to have. I think he likes the room, but boy, to to think you wouldn't add a player of that stature and what that guy could do. And it's funny, I've always thought, you know, this guy could be the long-term answer at a position outside a quarterback and maybe left tackle. Long term to me is like four years. It just is because things turn over and all this stuff. So if you get this guy and come in and be really, really good for four or five years, that's all you really need to hope for. Now, quarterback, you want more. But uh, yeah, I, I think he likes the room, but boy, he would, I think he would run Brock Bauer's name up there at 15 if he had the chance. I really do. Mike, if Brock Bowers is the guy, and I mean, it, it does appear as though he might be moving in front of where Indianapolis is going to draft at 15. Right. But let's just say that he's there and Chris Ballard runs up there. As Chris Ballard's running to turn in the name and Roger Goodell's standing there waiting for the uncomfortable embrace and sway back and forth with Brock Bowers' new Colts tight end. Give me the guy in the Colts tight end room that is the one groaning because it's the worst news for him. Oh, boy, good question. Mo Ali Cox, probably. Uh, although Mo's the best blocker of the group. Uh, the one that's most like Bowers would be Cut and Granson, as far as, you know, that kind of the smallish tight end and more of a pass catcher. But I well, don't do they go I with the two? Know. Do they almost go two tight ends at some point and, and be, to make up for the lack of blocking? 
Well, if you, you go two tight ends, you'd like one of them to be a blocker. That's why. That's what I mean. So, like, not, so which of those, yeah, which I, of that group is the best blocking tight end? So, which is the guy that goes, hey, that's cool. I'll welcome Bowers into the room because I'll do the blocking. Kalani Woods, probably. I mean, I think, and I, 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 again, I keep thinking roster building. They might get rid of Mo. They can free up. I don't know what it is. I haven't got, I haven't got the numbers. Three or four million dollars on Mo, and I think. Mo is a, such a great story, but I think we've seen Mo's ceiling, which is fine. He's a great story. Yeah, that's an interesting thing because what you what you really want is a tight end that can do both. And you know, Kelsey's a great blocker. George Kittle's a really good blocker too. But with Brock, Brock Bowers, you you would primarily be, initially be getting that that receiver, hoping he could be a an accomplished blocker. I don't think Dallas Clark ever rose to the level of decent blocker which is which is fine as long as you don't ask him to block yeah that's an interesting question i i would think if it's player for player i, well, I keep going back and forth probably kylan granson because that's primarily what what bowers would be right now i would think chap as i examine where the colts could go from here in terms of outside of offense and if they were to go defensively cornerback is going to be what springs or what screams the most to the room but there's also an interesting case to be had in terms of would they go out maybe trade for a veteran cornerback would they go get one in free agency as you look at that balancing act what's more likely to happen that they would seek out a corner maybe in the first or second round or they would be aggressive in that department for Gus Bradley in the first couple days of free agency here in a couple weeks I would prefer a veteran You've already got, you know, two guys going into the second year with Juju Brents and uh, and Jalen Jones, uh, and and the other two guys uh, uh, are are young as well. I would prefer a a, a veteran, similar to what they did with uh, Stephon Gilmore, which worked. I mean, he was he was probably their second best defensive player the year he was here. Uh, I would prefer that. And again, they've got they've got the the potential to do that. I'd, I'd go and get a veteran. And, and if you bring in another young guy, then, then he might be taking snaps away from Jones. I don't know. You can never have enough. You need, you need four corners. I mean, you need four really good corners and they don't have that right now. Would you trade for would, one? Because the name that uh, keeps coming up for, I mean, again, people know my wheelhouse, but Legarius Sneed, who was one of the best cornerbacks in the league last year, is going to be available from Kansas City. They're going to try to trade him. You're look, probably looking at a second-round pick, though. No higher than that, but a second-round pick to go get him. And then you have to pay I him. Thought I, I thought I saw they might franchise him. Did well, I, yeah, they're, 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 they, they're going to tag him, but the likelihood is that they would then trade him because he wants a yeah, long-term yeah, deal. Yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. And, again, I we know how much – the Colts and Ballard love their draft picks. Would they? How much would they give up? They've done it before. Uh, I would. I would. I would not be opposed to that. Uh, you're, you're gonna at least with a, if you get a new contract for it, you can you can kind of dictate what the contract is. You're gonna you're gonna pay out the nose to get one of those top two or three guys on the market. You just are. I would prefer if I were building a team to have a veteran corner. I just we we saw the problems that was created last year with. The young guys with Kenny Moore. I mean, God, there were three or four or five, six occasions where where communication was just botched, and guys were running wide open for big score, big touchdowns and catches. I would prefer a veteran. I wouldn't be the least bit off the train you're driving on a veteran corner. Chap, I, I got a an idea that I just came up with for next year's combine <clears throat> as it relates to you. You ready for this? Ready. So when you go to the combine, for, for those unfamiliar, the NFL combine, you got three groups of people. You got the national media guys that are all running around wearing suits with Air Jordans, <laughs> and I, I, that to me is odd, but whatever, I'm old. You got the second group, which is the assistant video editors that are all walking around wearing sweatsuits and taking pictures with Eddie White at St. Elmo, and that's cool. And then you got the third group, which are the prospects, right? And the prospects are all wearing sweatsuits that have the position number, the position and then the number of, of the – of the not their jersey number, but their assigned number, right? So like a defensive lineman, it says DL-74, you know, right? Whatever. For you, it seems perfect to me next year. Can we get you just a gray sweatsuit you wear that says TV-59? 
Doesn't that yeah. seem like a brilliant marketing scheme? Can I wear shorts still? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. You go, as long, now, I'm not asking you to do the 40, right? You don't need to do the 40. But just wear, the 40. wear the sweatshirt with the credential around it and look and look like a big wig out there. Well, I wouldn't. You, you can you can dress a pig up, but it's still a pig. So you, I wouldn't look like a big wig. But I'd do that. You, you give me a sweatshirt. I, I don't like the tight cuffs. Give me the, the loose cuffs on the arms. What about a monocle, chap? Would that make you big wig like? Yeah, Would you no, rock no, one of those? No, no. no? Okay. Yeah, you're going too far. All right. Too okay. Far. Mike, but, what's the yeah. what's the aspect of the NFL Combine that's overblown? If there is one, I mean, what is the one thing that you have seen in your years covering it? that was far more prioritized at one time that now we're realizing was bunk? The 40. I'm still not a big fan of the 40. I think it's cool. Uh, again, the, the, and the, the, they're not putting together a, a 4 by 100 track team because, again, we can come up with those guys and they would win the gold medal and they would, you know, not be in the league very long. It, it's 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 just crazy that that may be the the one tipping point in taking this guy over that guy. I you know you know like like offensive linemen. How often do they run forty yards? Not exactly. very often. Now receivers and corners. I I understand that the, maybe the short cones are more important. You know the the quick change in, in short distances. But I just think the forty there 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 may have been more bad picks on the forty time. And I'm really generalizing things than any other thing. Again, look, again, like you said, look at the, the top times in the 40 and what the players have done. And uh, I, I can I can remember when the Colts drafted uh, Philip Dorsett. And was it Jim Morris? I said, yeah. I said, oh, they would sort of love that pick. But said, yeah, yeah, but, you know, so I just think the 40 time can kind of skew things. But, again, these guys are smart. They're, they're really good ones. Maybe they kind of roll their eyes and say, it's pretty good 40 time. But I would hope to goodness that doesn't push a guy over the top when you've got three or four years of college tape and all these catches and yards and tackles and blocks. 40 time really is its the glamour event, and it probably always will be. Well, what's a, what's a, what's a favored rise? Like Xavier Worthy was expected to be like a back end of the first round type pick. He was right around 30 to 32, and then he runs a 4-2-1. Is five spots a fair enough leap for that? Yeah, that's what I don't know. Because uh, what what you have to understand, maybe it's one of the and, and Marvin Harris, a junior, kind of pointed to it that he's he's working out at Ohio State, I think it is, on football, on, on playing receiver, not so much, you know, how you come out of the blocks and get your arm up and you lean and all this. Some of these guys are training to be a sprinter you know, for this event. And then, you know, yes, that's important for receivers, outside guys at speed, but, but how much of it does it really translate? I, I don't know. So I, I don't know how, what, what a jump is. And if it does, then, then what does it say about all the work you did on again, on, on his, on, on how he talked to you guys, the, the psychological test and, and his college tape. I just, I just don't think the 40 time should be, should be that that much of a of a heavy chip in how you rate somebody you knew, they knew this guy was fast now maybe they didn't know he was that fast and maybe he was just that fast on that day everything clicked which is great you know i'd rather have that than having him come in running a a four four and saying what the hell happened to this guy and, and sometimes when you don't run as fast it does maybe that should tell you more you know, why didn't you run as well? I mean, you've known this is going to be your day for, you know, two months. So I just think the 40 time again can can just sort of skew a guy's value when you've got so much more information on a guy. But that, that's the world we live in. And I don't know that it'll change that much. Jab, don't forget, man, when, uh, when Earl Campbell showed up as a rookie in Houston, and somebody asked Bum Phillips what he thought about the fact that Earl Campbell couldn't finish his one-mile run. You know what Bum Phillips said, don't you? What was that? Well, when we have fourth and a mile, I won't give it to him. Well, it, it, it's like I, I don't think they – and I'm not sure Jerry Rice was ever timed. And Marvin Harris – yeah, hey, Marvin, how fast was your 40? I don't know. Well, you know, how fast are you? Well, nobody catches me. <laughs> you know, yeah. you want the can't catch me speed is what you want. Right. 
And then, well, and here's the other thing. If you have can't catch me speed, you don't want to be Darius Hayward Bay and then have can't catch anything with it, right? Or Hank Basket can't catch anything when you really need to catch something. <laughs> just, I saw I saw I saw a clip of that with how they're gonna change the maybe the kickoffs and the onside kicks. And God, somebody put up the Super Bowl with it the with the ball bouncing off his face. Plus I thought, thanks a lot. I was just about over. The entire city That's just like, started sweating. Thanks. I know. <laughs> thanks a lot, Hank. Hey, Mike, appreciate it. And next year, I'm going to get you that sweatshirt, TV59. If, if you bring it, I'll wear it. All right. I love it. That is that is our project for next year's combine. Mike Chappell, CBS4 and WXIN Fox 59. Well, by the way, speaking of some of those players that are going to be in the mix, we're actually going to talk from a national standpoint with one of the lead college analysts for NBC, Eric Froton, going to join us in about half an hour. When we come back, though, it was a big weekend in basketball, but Should we start having some concerns? I'll explain next. Are you dealing with foot, knee, hip?
We sent Eddie on a field trip. Eddie, uh, your report is? It's very nice outside. I saw some people in our company here out on the patio enjoying themselves some lunch. Were you jealous? Yes. Okay. I got crucified the one time I had lunch on this program, so <laughs> I learned my lesson. Well, they're, it, they're probably not like having their lunch in the middle of a big meeting, right? Like during a lunch break. I don't right? know. If it's a Zoom Zoom call, maybe it's a, it's one where they have to have the laptop. Do, do we know yet what we're doing for the big eclipse? Like the whole, the whole country's coming here, right? Everybody's coming here? IMS and the fairgrounds are both doing big things, right? If, if, if Query doesn't know, the company certainly has no idea, so I don't know who would ask for... Those plants. I mean, we got all kinds of, like, so on the day of the eclipse, are, are you going to be drinking a Sun King or a Moondrop distillery beverage? It's going to be one or the other, right? Uh, blue Moon? I'm going with Sun King. You're going to have a Sun King and a Blue Moon? <laughs> it seemed like a natural, right? You could, uh, you could pull out a Sunny D seltzer. <laughs> that, right? You could do that. That's yeah. fine. That's more of Jimmy's Avenue. That is more of my avenue. It's fine. And then it's going to be dark for how long? It's going to rain, I know, but like it's going to be dark for how long? I don't know. I, really I, mean, don't. I think forever. Nice. Four minutes, right? Four and a half minutes, something like that? Shout and out and at first I thought it was like right midday, a midpoint of our show, but I think it's right after we're off, right? Is it? I, th I think it's like three something. I'm not sure. But I think we should be somewhere partying it up. I would love to do that. Having fun I think it would be great. Um What's going on with Tyrese Halliburton? That's the big question for the Pacers because last night, a uh, lot of frustration in that game. Yeah, you, certainly you could be happy with TJ McConnell's 26 points. Cool. But they had no answer for Victim Webbyama. That That is not unusual when he's going. I mean, there's a reason that he is the most highly anticipated draft pick probably since LeBron James. And he was a – I mean – when he got going offensively, there wasn't really anything you could do about it. His, his blocks are so demeaning. Like, I don't care what position you play, who you are, and the Pacers were victims to it six times last night. But it's just like the effort level it takes because of just how quick and the wingspan is like a cat just swatting at a fly. Just like, oh, you're putting that up there? No, you're not, actually. That's in the fifth I know. row. It's crazy, right? 31 for him. In terms of Tyrese Halliburton, I think it's a slump. I do. I think it's just a bad stretch of play post All-Star break. This happens occasionally, in part because both for my sanity and Pacers fans, the whole sanity, I can't allow it to be still an extended issue from the injury. Because if it is, and Eddie and I were talking about this before we went on the air today, Jake, if it is that, let's say it's just something he's still dealing with from his injury a couple of weeks ago. Then that needs to be pinpoint, pinpointed and located by the athletic training staff. And if you need to rest him and shut him down for a week, then do it. Do it now before we get into, oh, he only has this many games left to get right before the play-in or the playoffs arise. Because if it is an injury and it's going to continue to nag and nag and nag, you're going to set this team up for failure come april now you have to wonder the financial aspect to that because that's 40 million dollars if you sit him out and he miss it doesn't meet that if 65 game threshold because but he has to make it all reason why he's back no he does not well he has to meet the criteria the 65 plus like you can make that argument now is he playing his way off the all-in correct but either way if he doesn't 65 games it doesn't matter but if he just to clarify this i'll make sure i'm right on this if he does not make an all-nba team and there's three, correct? There's correct. If he does not make one of those. And it's positionless now, so it's correct. the five best players for each team. If he did not make one of those, then it's a moot point. doesn't but, matter about the 65 games. But to Eddie's point, one scenario, if he continues to play but plays at a subpar level, then he is potentially removing himself off the All-NBA list. Which he would be on anyway if they sat him. If he if he sits and doesn't get to the 65-game mark, he is definitively yeah. off of the running. So if you are Tyrese Halliburton, you go with the one that has potential to remove you from the 
additional money as opposed to the one that definitively removes you from the money. I think it's just a bad stretch. I want to clarify that. I don't. I, think I would it's... hope that. Here's the thing. Since coming injury. back from the injury, Halliburton has had flashes. I mean, I was at the New Orleans game here. He was sensational. Mm-hmm. But in his – since the All-Star break, in the All-Star game, he hit 10 threes. Now, apples and oranges, I realize. But he hit 10 threes. That is a notable number, not because those are contested threes, but because of the fact that he has hit – nine threes in the six games since and he is shooting three-point shots is Tyrese Halliburton right now at a nine for 41 clip after the all-star game 21.9 percent not great they are five and ten when he makes one or fewer three-point shots also not great there is certainly it would seem something going on now the other thing that comes into play And I'm simply presenting this. I'm not stating this is the case. I'm presenting evidence. By the way, I don't know if I told you guys this. Maybe I did. Did I 20 times already? The defendant in the case that I was selected for, for, or that I was in the process of going through as a jury member was convicted, by the way. I think you mentioned that to us at minimum off air last Friday. and, And there is part of me that thinks to myself, so if, if I would have been on that jury and I mean, The jury did. You know, I wasn't in there for the evidence portion of it, but you do wonder if you were convicting someone of murder for like a lifetime sentence. If you wouldn't think about that in your mind, you know, twenty years from now, like, man, what if, you know, or, or, gosh, or do you just move on because it was your civic duty? I get it. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not defending the guy. I mean, clearly they had the evidence necessary. But anyway, in the case of Tyrese Halliburton, um, I'm simply presenting the evidence here. Okay, I'm not saying this is the case, but if you were to to look at all aspects or scenarios as to why his game has struggled, it was well-documented and well-known that Tyrese Halliburton and Buddy Heald were really close, and I think probably even closer once they were both traded here from Sacramento. I'm going to go back to what I've said before. Tyrese Halliburton was genuinely hurt when he was traded from Sacramento. Because Tyrese Halliburton, small-town guy. I mean, when I say small-town, I I don't mean, you know, Nineveh. But, I mean, you know, he's not from a big city. And then kind of off-radar college player as well. I mean, Iowa State is certainly a Power 5 school and is a better basketball program than it's given credit historically. But certainly, if you're playing at Iowa State, you're not playing under the same spotlight that you are for Midnight Madness at Kentucky or Carolina or, you know, Kansas, right? And so when he got into the NBA, I think that Tyrese Halliburton, it was in his mind that he was a king and was going to be a king for a long time. A Sacramento king, I mean. And when they decided to move him, along with Buddy Heald in the Sabonis trade, I think it truly hurt him. And I think that hurt was offset by a comfort factor of having Buddy Heald coming with him. So when the two of them arrived from Sacramento, I think there was a a comfort cushion with Buddy Heald being here. And then when you go through that with a teammate, it probably does make you even closer. Now, with all of that said, Buddy Heald wanted the trade from the Pacers. I think the Pacers would have been okay with holding on to Buddy Heald, but at the same time, as we've talked about many times, re-signing Buddy Heald was going to be tricky because the money necessary to retain Buddy Heald is money, A, that you need to kind of save up for when Neesmith comes up and when Isaiah Jackson comes up and when Matherin comes up. I mean, you got to start putting money aside a little bit. But secondly, the timelines didn't work out yeah, because – Healed is peak right now, if not even maybe slightly on the downside of that, and, and the Pacers are rising, right? So I understand all of it. And Healed was a good soldier and a good teammate throughout it all. But it's my understanding. I'm not in the locker room. I'm not in the front office. But it's my understanding from multiple people I've talked to that Buddy Healed made it pretty clear that if they were not going to re-sign him and he had turned down their initial offer, 
that he wanted to be traded. And then it got to the point where it was in their best interest, probably on on shorter notice than they would have liked, that they had to move him. And so they did so, and they salvaged, like, okay, who do we have that can shoot from the outside because we're losing outside shooting? Doug McDermott. Does Doug McDermott have the same ability to move off ball as Buddy Heald? No. Does he have the same quick release as Buddy Heald? Absolutely not. Does he shoot the ball well from the outside if he's spot up? Yeah. And he's familiar with the franchise, obviously, and fans are familiar with him. So you, you're doing what you can there to kind of salvage things. But did that interruption – of continuity for Tyrese Halliburton create for him a distraction that has hurt his game. Are you saying because of the fact that an offensive weapon is gone, did it disrupt his game, or because Buddy healed somebody who was who he was intertwined with, who he clearly cared and loved as a teammate, is now gone? Are you saying because of the weapon or because of uh, like a deeper emotional aspect well, of it? Well, I, I don't know. I mean – I'm saying I don't know either. What right? you're presenting, right. not what you're definitively saying, but what you're presenting. Probably a little of both, okay. right? I mean, you know, does you're, you're – and not only is Buddy Heald gone, but Pascal Siakam is there too. So, like, you're, the, the way your offense is set up is probably is a little bit different, sure. which creates adjustment or, or an acclimation period, right? Which goes back to our larger point on – We've still yet to see this group. We're just now starting to see every available member of this roster since the Pascal Siakam trade be out there. That changed once Neesmith returned against the Pelicans this weekend. So this is really, you circle the Pelicans game, that is day one of having your entire roster available to you post-Pascal Siakam trade. Yeah. Well, and how long does it take to make a fair assessment? I would argue more than just two games. It does, for sure, right? I, I mean, typically with a new team and a new season, you go 20 games, right, right. before you can truly assess. Now, the 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 other thing with Halliburton that we, that we don't know, but you have to factor in, again, if we're accumulating evidence, Tyrese Halliburton, and I have no reason to believe, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty certain in saying these are not factors, okay? But we've seen players change here. We've seen, I have always said, the one thing that you can't predict is when you have players that have not grown up in the spotlight, that have not been the guy. LeBron James, from the time he was nine years old, he's the guy. Kevin Durant, when he was in high school and then through, and, and the one year that he was in college and in Seattle and then Oklahoma, always been the guy. Always been the straw mix in the drink, right? Always. Steph Curry, for that matter. Small school, off radar, but he was absolutely the straw mixing the drink at Davidson and became a sensation through March Madness and had all kinds of attention on him. In Tyrese Halliburton's case, the one thing that you don't know, and you didn't know it with Paul George, and you kind of didn't know it with Victor Oladipo, because even though Oladipo was the best player on those Indiana teams, he had Cody Zeller homegrown talent, Mr. Basketball, cover of SI, taking the spotlight a little bit. You don't know how guys are going to react to that taste. When they first get that taste of fame, are they Frank the Tank? They can't handle it? I don't think that's the case with Tyrese Halliburton I'm either. at all. I think that's part of what makes him different. But, so I, it's not a long-term concern for me. But in the short term, coming off of the All-Star game, where the All-Star game weekend, with it being in Indianapolis, basically became the – Weekend serenade of Tyrese Halliburton. I would argue, though, that the area where that happened already was his national performance during the in-season tournament. And the numbers did not dip immediately after that. I'm with you. All-Star weekend is the second moment no, for him, but I think in-season tournament. I understand that, but the in-season tournament, Jimmy, and, and this is what I was getting at, that the in-season tournament love that he got, mm -hmm. for sure, did not come with having to host events and parties and, and things for, for like three straight days where you are the epicenter of – the world and everything is going through you like the NBA weekend all-star weekend in Indianapolis was like we're in Tyrese Halliburton's town and he was the de facto honorary like chairperson of the entire event he was the concierge for everything that took place and that has to have some sort of pardon the pun hangover effect just psychologically speaking or just fatigue you right no I don't disagree with any of that I just mean an area where egos could get in the way is once you taste national attention. And he got that for the first time, his coming out party 
was the in-season tournament. It's look at this guard for the Pacers that's just doing these electrifying things with the basketball and shooting from 35, and is he the next great guard in the league? And you didn't see after they are on the same floor as LeBron James and Anthony Davis, you did not see Tyrese Halliburton dip or become a different person after that. I would agree with you, though, in terms of the commitment and being an ambassador, that's totally different with All-Star Weekend. I just mean, at least you have another reference point to say, well, has he changed? And I don't think he has. I think he's still the same Tyrese Halliburton. I would simply say this after last night, and I heard it plenty of times from my parents. With last night's performance from Tyrese Halliburton and now back-to-back games without a three, I'm not necessarily concerned or angry, but I'm disappointed. Hi, this is ESPN's Mike Greenberg. and. E- So my understanding is we're a couple, uh, we're like 20 minutes away from summertime. It's a little cloudy right now. I just went and looked across the hall. A little cloudy. Although, I'll, I'll be honest with you. For us to go across the hall and look out the window, we've got to go through the IBC newsroom. And at first I thought it was a little cloudy, and then I thought, I don't think they've cleaned their windows in a while. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I don't know that, I don't know that there, John Herrick and, and Kurt Darling and the boys over there are getting out their, their window washing on a regular basis. And that's an that contract? was a washing or washing? Uh, well, it depends on which part of the state you're washing. in, I guess, right? Now, I also, and, and I was very disappointed by this, and maybe I'm like 20 years late on this. Maybe this happened like three years ago, you'd think, because I work here. Weather phone's gone. I realize there's no reason for it anymore because you can li- you literally look at your phone to get the weather. But, like, I miss the guy that does the downtown temperature, 72. Yep. It's the best. Good times. It's gone. 
It also told you the time, which also you don't need because you, that's on the device you're calling from. Correct. But back in the day, that was something, man. I had a telemarketing job when I was in high school. Okay. And when we, you know, we each had, I worked with like five different friends from high school, telemarketing. Wor- worst job ever, but also best job ever because they paid healthy, right? And literally everybody you'd call would just ha- cuss you out and hang up on you. And one day they came in and they said, uh, we just uh, went over our records for review here. Uh, who was in uh, booth eight, you know, for week two of March? You know, we're all looking around. It was actually a summer job, so it would have been like, you know, July. Whoever it was called the time and temperature 47 times in 30 minutes. <laughs> we're like, well, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. But I can automatically tell you uh, every single spot that runs for that. Now, was that forgetfulness, do you think, or is trying to boost the call numbers there? Like, oh, oh, I dialed was, out 47 times. No, it was computers. it was like every time the boss would back past you, like, I got to be, you know, it was like <laughs> Lloyd Braun selling computers. You're like, I just got to, uh, like, look like I'm calling somebody here, right? <laughs> no, trust me, we all had it. Like, and, and we... They had like a series of like four different, when you would call the weather line, th- they would say like, you know, brought to you by Union Federal Savings Bank or whatever. And we would have like a lot. I mean, there were, it was my buddies and I all in a row in these phone banks. So we would have like little basically like contests to see like, okay, who can get Union Federal next? You know, and we'd call in. It was, I don't know, it was like playing the roulette wheel, right? Uh, we're going to talk a little combine and what players that are right around where the Colts are picking really jumped out at. The Combine and showed themselves to be a viable option. That conversation next. 93.5 and NBC Sports, who's a draft analyst and is busy putting together all kinds of mock drafts. You can look at the top prospects, risers, fallers, etc. And in addition to that, this guy probably, I'm just going to guess, I don't know this, but I'm going to assume that of any media member, Eric Froton most dislikes the Combine. You want to know why? I'm going to push against that based on his tweets, but you go ahead, why? Well... Not the combine itself, but traveling to the combine. I get it. Like Indianapolis, you know, everybody. It, it was it was kind of weird because it was almost like 
the NFL or somebody asked all of the writers at once to send out something about Indianapolis. Like, all of a sudden, everybody was sending the same tweet. Like, this always belongs in Indianapolis. It was at the same time every writer was saying that. I hope it was Visit Indy. Oh, Visit Indy is doing, like, I mean, that's guerrilla kind of warfare what it felt like, work, right? trying to stick it to the NFL to say, hey, keep this thing here. Uh, and also, by the way, the world's worst kept secret is now official. Jason Kelsey announcing his retirement from the Philadelphia Eagles. Th- that's the 17th time he's done that in the last two months, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but like when you're when you're basically shotgunning beers and and you know going shirtless in ten degree weather and all that, like you think it's on the wall? Team, it's pretty much kind of an indication, <laughs> right? Do we have Eric? Okay, so Eric Froton is with NBC Sports, and Eric, I was just saying, I'm strictly guessing, not the combine itself, okay, but all that goes into the combine. There's one area of it that I'm guessing that you have to actually totally dislike and be against and that's i'm not trying to put words in your mouth but this is my prediction the only negative to the combine for eric froton of nbc sports is the fact that you've got to leave san diego for three days or four days or five days like it's the great and you live in san diego right yes sir oh yeah the last 18 years i'm originally from boston but uh i am lucky enough to be a southern california resident taxes and gas aside yeah i would never (laughs) leave san diego though right because it's like 72 i mean i'm guessing right now it's 72 sunny and 20 percent humidity right oh absolutely Uh, but the thing is you know you got to remember it it, during the summertime it doesn't get quite as hot as everywhere else it stays around that 75 down to low 60s all the time so it doesn't get hot hot you know uh, people think that the summertime it's that's how it is. Now, it's pretty mild. So if you're thinking about visiting San Diego, typically the best time, it's actually real nice during the Santa Ana's when they blow in in the fall. Um, that's when you're going to get kind of the most warm weather. But you got to be careful. Sometimes you get some some rather mild summers, and that's certainly what we got last year. Listen, it's like – here, we don't see the sun for four months, and Eric's like, listen, one of the real drawbacks here is there are times it gets to 66. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, okay, Eric, when it comes to the NFL Combine, uh, give me the guy that is the Santa Anas. Give me the guy that going into the Combine, things really heated up, and all of a sudden he, he was warmer on the radar than he was three weeks ago. Well, I mean, I, I would certainly say that number one – Xavier Worthy has to come to mind. I mean, you run a 4 one you break the all-time speed record. It's going to set off some signal flares. So, um, you know, you'll certainly see in terms of the, the early returns, I, I think it's pretty fair to say that he's been pegged in that first round. But, gosh, you know, if, if I think about that receiving group in general, it's hard to peg just one guy. Because if you go by the relative athletic score measure, which is a, a, a barometer that it seems a lot of at least the media and public facing people use, that 18 wide receivers test in the 91st percentile or better for traditional NFL caliber wide receivers uh, over the past, you know, however many years since 1987. So we have got, and it seems like year after year, an increasingly more freaky group of these pass catchers as these college, off- college offenses continue to churn out you know, more pro-style and more aerial-oriented offenses. So, Eric, the parlay off of that comment about receivers and the depth of this core that we've been talking about, and I want your input on this, Eric Broton of NBC Sports. Indianapolis is drafting 15. They have probably three or four areas of – I think, equivalent need. But receiver is absolutely one of them when you have a young quarterback in Anthony Richardson. If you are Indianapolis at 15, does the depth of this receiving core, A, necessitate that you go ahead and take one at 15 because, man, you can get a serious game changer, or B, give you the luxury of waiting until a later round to address receiver and still get a good one? Ooh, I would say that with Indianapolis situation, if I'm not mistaken, you'd be looking possibly at cornerback. Would that be another option? Yeah, corner, um, they always are looking for edge. Chris Ballard mm-hmm. loves that position. And then if Bowers is there, that's going to be tempting as well. Mm, yeah, I can't play on that Bowers one. I mean, I know, gosh, coming out, I love Jelani. Don't get me wrong. He, he really, in person, Jelani – 
Woods looked like the Terminator. Uh, I can't stress enough about what what a scary human being he is. I, I really think that if he stays healthy, he could be effective. But he's not the move tight end that Brock Bowers is, let's be honest here. When it comes to this wide receiver group, I tend to be in a gambling mindset. I, I tend to want to kind of, you know, uh, if you have somebody you think is a legit game changer for a need, um, be it a, a Wiggins type, you know, even though he's pretty light, my gosh, he ran pretty fast as well. Um, you know, if a Terry and Arnold were to slip to 50, no, oh gosh, I think that would be extremely, uh, you know, that'd be something that'd be pretty tantalizing. Whereas you could get a great wide receiver in round two. And you guys have already kind of done that. Look at Michael Pittman. He was around round two wide receiver. He's right around that range you'll be in this year. Um, and he was he was sensational. And I loved him coming out of USC. You know, another one, he followed up Drake London and, and kept that train rolling on that outside exposition. Um, you could get somebody who I think is, is fairly equivalent. Xavier Leggett could be there in that second round. If you saw him in the combine, that man is fully filled out at 220 pounds. He went and ran a 4.35. He dazzled at the Senior Bowl, uh, uh, sort of a fifth-year wide receiver, a latecomer in terms of um, – you know, his production, but my gosh, it's there. Uh, if you, depending on how you want to go, if there's a speedster, you know, you're particularly interested in Devontae Walker, while he has problems in terms of, I think, some of his breaks, you could certainly, you, you can't fade his speed, and he tested in the 98th percentile. And obviously, I think possibly the most freaky tester of all was Adonai Mitchell for Texas. Um, he hasn't been really mocked in the first round. He's been in that second round range. It would be I would say a gift to get a receiver uh, with these dimensions. And, and he's and got a Pittman-type size, right? Isn't he a bigger guy? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. He, he checked in plus 200 pounds. He's in that 6'3", six, 6'4", six, range, and he ran a, a sub-4, 440 as well. Uh, and that goes to double for Brian Thomas of LSU, who I know I've seen mock even before the combine at that 17 range to Jacksonville. That's been a very common target of his. So, you know, he probably won't be on the board, but – there's a lot of talent in this wide receiver group. If you want Ricky Pearsall, the one question I had with him was his athleticism. I don't have that anymore. He tested in the 98th percentile. I mean, his, his ability to catch the ball is beyond reproach. So there's so many options in this receiver class, so much talent. Uh, I think you could kind of sit and just let the board play you. And whoever you like the most in round two, you're going to get a star. So maybe address that that initial need of cornerback or Bowers, if you, there's a particular edge, if Latu or Verse, if you want the more power version outside of Quiddy, um, I think that could be. I think that's probably the direction I would take, respectfully. Eric Froton of NBC Sports is our guest. Eric, you mentioned Xavier Worthy in his four two one forty time going into the combine. He was mocked, in, and I know they don't mean anything, but he was mocked right around the back end of the first round, early second. Jake and I were discussing the value of forty times and. The Darius Hayward Bay jokes insert themselves here, but when you run a four-two-one, how many spots should that elevate your stock, if at all, on a draft board? Well, I mean, it certainly helps the the perception, of course, if you're on the fence about all right. Well, we know this kid is explosive and what have you, but there's you know how's his cornering ability, and obviously the, the ball tracking in the hands is something that you look at with Worthy. That's a common refrain. Um, but I think it kind of, if anything, I, it's not going to shoot him up to the beginning of the first round. You know, I would say Darius Hayward Bay. I would use another example, Henry Ruggs. If you remember, he was the first wide receiver taken that year. He, I think he was number 12 overall to the Raiders. Not to beat up on the Raiders or anything like that, but, you know, it simply is what it is. Um, so I, I just think he, instead of him being, you know, in, in past years, he would crawl into the first half of the first round. I think you're looking at spots or so. But I do think that the, always the realistic range was that mid two to early second, uh, or excuse me, to late first. I, I think he's pretty comfortably in that late first, early second range. I, I don't think he slips too far in round two. Is there any position group where the 40 time jumps off and, and elevates like crazy a range for a prospect or maybe more so than others sure i mean there's definitely look at chop robinson on the edge i mean that's 
the edge players are the freakiest guys you see when you're at the combine here. You know, everybody, it's funny, like, it, you know, the common outside of football vernacular is, oh, you know, built like a linebacker. So it's, it's not the linebackers. It's the edge guys. Those guys are the ones that are just simply defy physics and are the best athletes in the room, in my opinion. And that's why when you get them out there in the field, there's, there's a standard to be measured up to. You got Dallas Turner out there. He didn't. He, he did nothing to dissuade anybody from the fact that he has all the potential in the world. He didn't put up Will Anderson numbers, but he put up the kind of testing you need to see of a premium top end edge. And I feel like Chop Robinson did that too. I mean, you don't see a lot of breaking four five four point five here. You know, he did four point four eight. It's insane. And let's not forget, he, he ran a 4.25 shuttle that was a 91st percentile mark. So um, I just think that he was a guy who was, even in a lot of drafts, you saw him slipping out of the first round, you know, basically due to size. He's not quite as, you know, perceived as big as you want him to be. But, hey, you know, he checked in at 254. 6254, that's just fine. You know, you saw some guys who were down there in that 245 range, his teammate Adisa Isaac being one, run far less competitive times. So I think just with him checking in at the weight that we wanted to see in that 255 range and him running so well, doing the shuttle, I feel like he checked all those boxes. And now he's firmly in probably the early 20s, I would say, going from possibly out of the first round. Eric Broton is our guest. He is the lead college football analyst for NBC Sports. We're talking about the draft. Eric, aside from quarterback, I mean, I'm going to take that answer off the table for you here. Aside from quarterback, the position when being drafted into the NFL that lends itself to the highest percentage of swing and miss probability and the hardest to get right is what? Uh, You know, in previous years, it was kind of wide out. You know, you said there's the Patriots meme about not knowing how to draft wide receivers, you know, and that's, there's certainly something to that. But I feel like, gosh, recently we've seen the early round wideouts be pretty darn good. There's going to be a Kadarius Tony here and there. There's going to be your, your Quentin Johnson. So the jury is still kind of out on him. So um, I, I would say that that's kind of gotten a little more refined. I would say that, you know, it probably cornerback, cornerback, CB. We've seen some swings and misses over the years, you know, recently. Um, you know, there's the certain draft, but Joe Horn hasn't. Gosh, you think Carolina would like to have the number seven pick a few years ago back on Horn? You know, they, they could have got themselves Justin Fields and had a, the beginning of a rebuild or something like that. So um, that, obviously. Um, there was also the Virginia Tech cornerback from, uh, I want to say, the previous class or the one after that who was taken, uh, his name eludes me, but he was taken extremely high. I want to say he was like a 16 pick. And we have seen next to nothing out of him, real back problem. So uh, the high-end cornerbacks, like they're asked to do so much nowadays. Like if you want to be a CB1, you know, and you're coming out, that sort of thing, these receivers, as we discussed, are getting better and better. I think that's getting tougher and tougher to find the true Jalen Ram- Ramsey's up top. Eric Froton of NBC Sports, nice enough to take some time with us. Eric, whenever we talked about Brock Bowers to people at the Combine and why he was being mocked around the 10 to 15 to 17 or 18 range, they always said it's not a knock on the player. It is just how deep offensively, whether it's O-line, whether it's wide receiver, you name it, quarterback, of course, that are just going to go in front of him because of how offensively rich this draft is. You're one of the few I've seen, and I know this is from about a week ago, so you're at liberty to change it between now and April. You're one of the few I've seen that have Brock Bowers inside the top 10 or right at the top 10. You had him in New York with the 10th pick. Why do you see him going around there, or do you feel like there's a margin for error where he could indeed fall to the back half of the first round right around where the Colts are? Oh yeah, well, I mean, if you guys are at what fifteen, yeah, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say back half of the first round. So you, yeah, I mean, you guys are right there in the middle. I don't think he slips past twenty. First, I don't think he lands in the twenties. I think that ten to nineteen or ten to twenty range is really the sweet spot because it's just the nature of the position at tight end, especially after the Kyle Pitts fiasco. Uh, you know, for Atlanta, you know, you're taking some time to develop. 
That's just the nature of the position. Usually you know, year three, four, five, they're really maturing and hitting their stride. Unfortunately, in the NFL, once you hit you know, year three, four, it's time to extend you or, or make a decision. So um, when it comes to just the simple, the way the salaries are doled out and, you know, the, the franchise tax and everything, you're going to be cheaper at tight end than you are going to be at wide receiver if you have a, a top end guy. So that's just the, the reality of the economics of the game. With Bauer himself, it's, it's very similar. I mean, gosh, it isn't too hard to take a look at Brock Bauer's tape in the SEC, a true, true freshman breakout. I mean, frankly, with the kind of emphasis we haven't seen very often from the tight end position, and he maintained that level of play through each season. Two-time, you know, he was the number one weapon on a two-time national championship team as a freshman and, and sophomore, true. You watch his athleticism. I mean, very few guys have the burst and the acceleration that you're going to watch from Bowers, the way he works the inside interior skill down the seam. I mean, he is a game breaker down there. And not just that, but like he, his contact balance, he absorbs contact extremely well. And he just has that, the kind of juice and burst that is simply abnormal for tight ends. Is he a and, Dallas you know, Clark? He, I mean, to, to put it in Colts fan terms, is he a Dallas Clark? Oh, absolutely. I, I think I think he has a higher ceiling than Dallas Clark, um, who did have, you know, while he was extremely dependable. I mean, you, you look at the athleticism and stuff that he puts on tape for Brock Bowers, and there really aren't many peers for his skill set. You know, he's a little smaller, but the sheer athleticism and speed and dynamicism, it's just uncommon for the position. He does have a unicorn element to his game, so I'm very curious to see how he translates, but what a weapon he would make alongside Pittman. For Anthony Richardson, I mean, that would be just a dangerous proposition. Eric Proton, our guest for NBC Sports, the league college football writer. So in that capacity, while we have you, Eric, I want to get for our listeners your perspective, thoughts, insights uh, on Indiana hiring Kurt Signetti and bringing him from James Madison. Obviously, we know the challenges that Indiana has, but can the success that he has had throughout his career thus far translate to Indiana in the Big Ten? Oh my gosh, like how, what can you say about the job he did at James Madison last year? I mean, you, he, every single position, if you look at that team that he had last year and you go and take a look at what the portal situation looks like and the defections, that team was rated by the Power Five. I mean, you look at and, and the higher end teams in the G5, you know, there, there isn't even a Power Five anymore, but uh, Jordan McLeod, you know, a, a quarterback that he took from USF who had, you know, it was his third stop. You know, he, he was rudderless looking for a direction here. He had just, you know, uh, been been sort of jettisoned from USF. And he came out and was, if not the, one of the tippity-top, very best elite quarterbacks in that group of five. Uh, you look at the entire defense. Nobody in in the entire you know, uh, FBS structure wanted to play that James Madison defense. I want to say they, they even ended up possibly under 10 points a game they were allowing. The whole top-to-bottom operation, he molded that, brought it up into the, the group of five, brought them up into the FBS, and in year one weren't just bowl caliber. They were winning the Sun Belt caliber. They were the best defense in the entire G5. So I just, in terms of what he did with that program and what he could bring to Indiana to clearly – you know, needs, you know, no offense to Tom Allen, but it's been a tough couple of years after the, the magical 2020 Michael Penix season where you went four and two. You know, everybody remembers that. Everybody wants to be back to that era of Indiana, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, you know, with the Big Ten being a big-time operation now, it's, it's one of the two primetime places to play. You're in the big sandbox now, and you have an opportunity to really be – make headways – in the biggest stage. So I, I have great feelings about Indiana. Uh, I, I love, you know, I remember some of the great teams and I want nothing more than to see the Hoosiers rise. So good luck to Mr. Finetti. So for the sake of fair and balanced here, I've got to ask about Purdue. Ryan Walters, obviously, I, I think Purdue fans, kind of a reset for them last year, but you look at Purdue and your thoughts are what? Sure, well, I mean, absolutely a reset. 
I mean, gosh, does it get any more of a reset going from the Brom brothers where they're throwing the ball at a top 10 rate every single year that they were there? You know, and you have the magical age in Aiden O'Connell. You know, obviously, what a story. I mean, God, going down in Purdue lore right next to Drew Brees. I mean, a couple of legends there. So there was going to be a reset, you know. And Hudson Card comes in, he's trying to do his best. But it, this is clearly a more run-based offense. I mean, look at what he did, you know, to credit to Coach Walters. He brought in Tyrone Tracy, who, if we're talking about the combine, he had the second highest RAF score of the entire running back group. Yes, you know, two days ago. You're talking about physical freak. He took him and went from wide receiver to running back. And, you know, it became was incredibly productive. Devin Mockaby came of age underneath his system. And you got to expect, at least on offense, there are going to be some growing pains. And they could have stopped the run better. You know, that, that Wisconsin game comes to mind early in the season where, you know, they, Tanner Mordecai kind of became a option-type quarterback. But, you know, when I look at Coach Walters and the turnaround that he orchestrated at Illinois, let's not forget that was a team that was allowing almost 35 points a game the year before he came in. You know, year one, he lopped, I want to say, you know, almost two touchdowns off of that. And then by the time year two came around, that Illinois defense, I mean, year two of Ryan Walters, that was absolutely an apex top five defense nationally. And, you know, that cannot be, uh, you know, taken lightly, especially when you're developing a guy like Merriweather in with a three-star guy. These are three-star recruits. Ryan Walters took and made that team into a 10-win Big Ten team. That defense, multiple guys drafted. You'll see Johnny Newton from that team drafted in the first round as well, along with Merriweather. You also have guys like Keith Randolph. I mean, the way that he coached up three-star recruits is what you want to see out of Purdue. I believe in Ryan Walters. Uh, I think in terms of a coaching hire, that's as good as you could possibly ask for, at least from a defensive perspective. And it's just a matter of, you know, how you can get Graham Harrell out there and, and uh, you know, the offense to click. I, I think the defense is going to be there this year. And, Get ready for some more classic Big Ten, you know, slow-paced games where you guys are using Mockaby to, to, to beat up the other team. Well, coming up Wednesday at 2.30, Tyron Tracy's going to join us. So if you're a fan of college football or a Purdue fan in general and followed his combine journey, we'll have that conversation with him. Eric Froton is our guest of NBC Sports. And, Eric, the Big Ten next year, when it transforms with the arrival of Oregon, Washington, UCLA, USC, how different are the teams coming in going to be for the Big Ten now that both Kalen DeBoer and Chip Kelly have departed Washington and UCLA respectively? Does it lessen at all the addition of these four teams, or is it still, hey, yes, it'll be new offenses, new defenses, new looks, but this is still four of the top names in the sport coming to the Big Ten? I mean, it's a fair question, you know, because you look, if you're talking, talking about just the current roster strength of each of these four programs, Oregon's certainly in the best position. You know, you're not really worried about how the Ducks are going to translate. They they hit the portal hard, brought in Dylan Gabriel, um, brought in Evan Stewart, who is a top three pro caliber wide receiver for the 2025 class. So they'll be in good shape. But look, there, there's an element of rebuilding to each one of those other three programs. Washington being the most stark, they're literally – the entire offense and almost, I think only just two players from even the second team offense are gone, be it through the portal, be it through everything. So incoming coach, former Arizona HC, Jed Fish comes in and it's a full on stud down the studs rebuild year zero coming off the greatest season in arguably program history. So, uh, I think you're going to see certainly a recalibration over there in year one. I don't think there's any way to get around that, no matter who they bring in. Um, with USC, it's the Miller Moss era. You know, it, they Lincoln Riley is renowned for dipping in the portal and doing what he needs to do. He did it all the time in, in at Oklahoma. He brought in Jalen Hurts. He brought in Baker Mayfield. He brought in Tyler Murray. He didn't do that this year with Miller Moss, who's a fifth, six year program guy over there at USC replacing the great Caleb Williams. He could have went shopping and, and pulled whoever he really wanted to out of the portal. All they went and did is grab you, UNLV, QB, Jalen, um, 
uh, Daniel, I forget, I forget his last name, is Judge Jaden Maiden. So they brought in Jaden Maiden, and that's decidedly a mid-tier sort of a backup option. So they're in certainly in a retooling mode. Uh, and then definitely when you look at UCLA, out goes Chip Kelly, um, out goes Dante Moore, who is supposed to be their wunderkind, bringing UCLA into the Big Ten, you know, five-star QB. He's now at Oregon. So um, there's certainly a, a restructuring there. At least they they hired in-house with Deshaun Foster, who was basically the team demanded they sort of, uh, you know, extend him. So they have a program legend, Sean Foster, who is also looked at in outside, outside coaching circles as a potential hire. So um, I do think that they're at least structurally more intact and not down the studs, but uh, I'm very curious to see what happens with Washington USC. Okay, before we let you go, and by the way, Eric Froton's X Twitter, whatever you want to call it, is at CF Froton, that's F-R-O-T-O-N, where you can read all of his work for NBC Sports talking about the draft in college football. Eric, did you go to my? This is what my research tells me. Did you go to Wilmington High School in Massachusetts? I went to none other than Wilmington High School in Wilmington, Massachusetts, okay. where my dad, my father, Rick Froton, uh, is a Hall of Famer in the athletic department. I am not a well, Hall so of that, Famer in the athletic so that, department. That's the Wildcats, right? Is. Was it Wilmington Wildcats? That is correct. Okay. Wilmington Wildcats. So yes, on sir. Wikipedia, whoa, whoa, hey, you well, did your research. Well, right? see, here's what I always do. I it, it, because to me, in listening to you and all of your insight, and your and I always marvel at a guy's ability from San Diego to even know like you know what's going on with Indiana football, right? I mean, there there aren't people in <laughs> uh, there aren't people in Allen County of Indiana that know that. Now, it only lists it from your high school, and not, and I'm not disparaging Wilmington High School by any stretch of the imagination, but it only lists no on problem. Wikipedia, which is all knowing. Four, four, a total of four notable alumni. Now, now you are more notable in your contributions to the game of football, for example, than Mike Esposito, right? Well, m- maybe in the modern lexicon, but not in the hometown. All right, Mike Esposito <laughs> is a legend. Uh, also, was the uh, school truant officer, I believe, over in Bill Rickham, Massachusetts. The rough and tumble Bill Rickham, Massachusetts. So, I would argue Mr. Esposito is a legitimate legend and deserves it. But if I had to go with the one with the most renowned, it'd probably be Jason Bure, who is a former pitcher for the Chicago White Sox. He I'm is pretty listed. sure that uh, you guys remember him around here, right? Now, yeah, he is listed. Yes, he is remembered for sure. Now, but here's the thing, though. I want to know more about this fella. Um, and if if this is like a household name, and I'm butchering it, I apologize. Uh, some guitarist from Cobra Starship. Are you familiar with this? Like, did you rock out to Cobra oh. Starship a lot when you were at Wilmington? Oh. Who, what is the name of this guitar? That, that would be – Riley. okay, hold on. Now, just so you know, Eric, I'm not saying you should be offended, <laughs> but this is listed as a more notable alum of your high school than are you, right? So, like, you know, uh, Ryland – hold on. Ryland Blackington. You familiar with Ryland? I have no idea. I have no record of, of a Ryland Blackington, unfortunately. <laughs> well, did you ever go uh, see Cobra Starship when they novel? rocked out? Did they play your prom? I don't know what a Cobra. St- what is a Cobra Starship? Cobra Starship. Exactly thank you for Starship asking. Is. An American dance rock band from New York City, but their guitarist is a graduate of Wilmington High School. I'm just well, telling is you. this a recent band? I, maybe I'm well, not. Well, thank to you the for asking that. Day. I can also tell you they're years active, 2005 to 15. Then they got back together again for in 2021, and that was the end of it. Wow. Well, I'm not familiar with Cobra Starship. I do know. I actually have. You know, that's disappointing that that's the most notable musician from, from <laughs> Massachusetts. Yeah. Because I will tell you, my this is, actually ties in. This is a great one. None other than the great John Lynch, my boy JL, who was my, my catcher in baseball. I was actually a baseball player. Uh, my entire life, through minor, minor league, major league, pony league, high school, one of my best friends, he is the drummer for Steppenwolf. Really? So why doesn't okay. JL get his love? Where's JL's love by Wikipedia? We got <laughs> well, Steppen, Steppenwolf drummers. The class hey, listen, Landa Kai's love Steppenwolf. I just know that. That's that's as much as I know about that band. But you know, the great John K. Yes, sir. And it, so I mean, you know, I wish if we're going music, JL deserves his spot. I'm going to have to do something about that. Get on Wikipedia, Wikipedia, man. You can edit it, Eric. That's the beauty of it. When you are not, by the way writing for NBC Sports and covering the draft as it's upcoming with your mock drafts as well and finding out what Indianapolis is going to do at spot 15. Eric, we appreciate the time, man. 
Dude, thank you so much for, for the stroll down memory lane. I appreciate it, and I thank you very much. Anytime you need it, I'm down to come back and talk Big Ten. Come All right, sounds that. good. We appreciate that, and we will definitely take you up on that offer because there's a lot going on. It is so weird, Jimmy, still for me to think that when a guy from Southern California says, I want to talk Big Ten, that it's actually now applicable in his neck of the woods. It's a beautiful thing. It's crazy, isn't it? I'm Just telling you, like, you, you do the right thing with that map graphic, Big Ten. That's so I've I'm got saying. a Big Ten – expansion as it relates for indiana and purdue fans question for you okay okay i want you to mull it over i'll tell you in the break you mull it over and give us your answer and we'll do it on the other side sounds like a plan all right your nose is for
Eddie Garrison dipping into the uh, jukebox. A little Cobra Starship. That's not bad, actually, right? We know that song. Heard that one. They have another one called You Make Me Feel that reached number one here in the States back in 2011. But those are probably the two most known songs. They were popular, got mainstream when I was in high school. By the way, I had a, and I'm going to get to my Big Ten question here. I had a furious debate once with a coworker who was a few years older than I, whose son was like in college at the time. So this would have been probably eight years ago. Well, when was the song? Um, I'm going to butcher the lyrics. My apologies. Move like Jagger. Uh, 2011. Oh yeah. So Move I was going like to say Jagger. 10 years ago. 2011, right? 2012. At that time, I had a coworker who had a child that was like in college. 2010, my apologies. Okay. So at that time, so the, the, the debate was probably like 2012, like two years after that. But I had a coworker that was trying to convince me that the only reason any college person would know who Mick Jagger is was because of that song. And I'm like, I, I, I realized they aren't like a mainstream touring band, but just in the American lexicon, in the American culture, people still know of the Rolling Stones, do they not? Yes, but I feel like that it would, because it always does this with Father Time, I feel like if you asked at the time, 20-something, 16-year-olds, like it might not have been as... Well, but I mean, but do you know who Mick Jagger is? Yes, at least of the Rolling Stones. Like I'm, I, I am, yeah, but I, I mean, mean had but you, you asked somebody, been, but you're the... even younger than that. Like because, in you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, like I mean, I don't know. I I think that he is still, I, and I get it. I mean, I totally understand that. Like even like the Who, but the, but Jagger to me is a little different because he's still for his age right. is so, he's pretty. I mean, he's. You just see him a lot referenced, and they still tour, and he's you right. know he's. He's, I think his wife, he has like a younger wife and, you know, the whole deal, right? Like he just seems like a youthful, I mean, it's hard to believe his age, but anyway, so here's my question for the Big Ten with the Pac-10 coming in. If you were going to go on a road trip, if you got together with your guys, Jimmy, and you and your friends from, well, use for you the case of Indiana or for people listening that are fans of Purdue, Todd Meyer, whoever that are fans of Purdue, if you were going to go, and maybe it's different answer for football and basketball. Maybe the answer differs. But if you were going to go on an away trip to see your team play on the road and you had to pick one of those four, is the most desirable when considering all factors, fan base of opponent, venue of opponent, competitiveness of opponent, things to do, weather, etc. Oregon, Washington, UCLA, USC. Which one is the most desirable trip? We'll begin from the football side of things. It's a very difficult question because there's a lot of great environments that are entering now into the Big Ten foray. But for me, it's going to be the same answer it was when the initial announcement arrived. I would love to take a trip to the Coliseum okay. and go see my Big Ten school of choice, in this case, Indiana, Go play against USC. Okay, I, I think that would be. I mean, that's obviously a really good. I think any of the four would be very compelling reasons for any of the four, yeah. right? I think USC for a lot of people would probably be tied for second. Don't you think most people, especially if you're an Indiana fan, isn't that the only way that you're going to see how you play in the Rose Bowl? Ever? Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I mean. I mean, Kurt Signetti's gonna, you know. What's that? Kurt Signetti's on a mission. So just Google let's, let's, him, right? Let's just press a pause for a Ma second. Maybe you're right. That. Maybe you're right. But, but yeah, okay. So that's a good one, Eddie. Which one would you want to go to? If you're gonna go, whichever team, but you and your guys, you, you and your one friend, what's his name? Alec. Yeah, Alec. You and Alec, you and Alec are getting your smart card and you're driving out. Which one are you going to? I know where you're going because you already told me you're going. Um, I'm going a little bit away from where Jimmy's going just to be different. I'm going to say Husky Stadium. Ooh. Yeah, see that, and that's nice. a really good answer, man. I'm telling you, Husky Stadium. I've said it before. If you go to see a game, you want to go towards the beginning of the year before the weather really turns. That's what I've been told that we're going uh, middle of April, and that's like the perfect time to go. You absolutely have to go when you go to Seattle, Eddie, to go see. You're going to go to a hockey game and then see the Reds play, right? 
Yeah, we're going to go watch the Kraken uh, home finale Thursday. I think that's like the 16th or 11th. I can't fully remember. It's the 11th, and then the Reds are in uh, town Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, giving out King Griffey Jr. bobbleheads, so we're going to go Monday night, come home with a bobblehead to add to the collection. So, and that obviously a Mariners bobblehead, right? That would be correct, him um, robbing the home run. You absolutely should go to Husky Stadium because the weather's going to be clear, and if you go to University of Washington and you go to the stadium, you'll see it, it's amazing. Because as you're sitting there and you look to your right, I believe it is, you see Lake Washington, which looks like the ocean. And then the the Cascade Mountains are visible as well. It is stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, Seattle, when the weather is clear, which it should be in April, is stunning. Uh, from a ba- I, I, Me personally for football, I think Husky Stadium might be my call as well. Although, seeing Indiana play or Purdue, either one, in the Rose Bowl itself, Pasadena is so nice, man. And if it's one of those late evening games or, you know, late afternoon games into the evening when the sun is setting behind the stadium, perfect. I mean, it's perfect, right? Now, basketball-wise, which one? I, you can't say Oregon because that floor is horrible. Well, that was that would have been the reason they were my second choice because I actually like the exotic nature of the floor, but let's not, oh, open up, let's not do that right now. We, I don't have the time. Uh, Pauly Pavilion. I'm going on the history trend there. Let's go to Pauley Pavilion. Let's go see all the UCLA banners. Let's go. Yeah, that's cool. Shake John Wooden's hand, statue or whatever, all that, you know. Let's go go Pauley Pavilion. Eddie? Well, Jimmy, once again, taking the easy route here, stealing my answer. I apologize. You can, here's you, the we th- can share thoughts. Here's the thing about no, Pauley Pavilion. No. I was stunned. I have not seen a game there. Open disclaimer. Not seen a game. Okay. Did you but break in in the middle of the night? Close. One of the years that IndyCar was out in Long Beach, um, I went ahead and like rented a car to just tool around and do my own thing and went to Westwood and went to – I mean, I've been on the UCLA campus a billion times, but I went to Pauley Pavilion. And the outside of it, I mean, it's super cool because, I mean, the grass is immaculate and the campus is beautiful and there's a statue of wooden. And then you go into it. And, I mean, it is cool to see, you know, Reggie Miller's number and all that. Kareem, obviously, right? But I'll be honest, like, Pauley Pavilion feels almost like a multi-purpose gymnasium more than it feels like a historic basketball arena. It's kind of weird. Like, and I think it is. I mean, I think they do, like, every, you know, like, Assembly Hall or Mackey Arena, like, Purdue Volleyball now has, I believe, its own venue. And for Indiana, there's kind of that sports complex now where, I mean, obviously the men's and women's basketball team played Assembly Hall, but I don't, But I think most of the other sports, volleyball may, I'm not sure. But Pauly is just like this multi-purpose, it's like being at the hyper. It was just kind of weird. Like it almost felt like the seats were like the rollout, you know, like in high school, the bleachers that sure. roll out. That's kind of what it felt like. It just was very, not sterile. But it didn't have the, the like, wow historic factor. You still would absolutely want to see a game there, don't get me wrong, because of what it is, right? Sure. But And admittedly, your perception could have been swayed had it been a game with a packed capacity crowd, right? Co- correct. That's correct, yes. I mean, to be fair, yes. Now, Oregon, you know, Eugene I think would be cool to visit. I've been to Oregon State, but I've not been to, to Eugene. Eugene's about another hour, I think, south of Portland from where – Corvallis is so I've not been to Eugene so you seeing the campus would be I'm assuming because Oregon is absolutely beautiful the, the the state of Oregon the coast of Oregon's beautiful but the floor itself would drive me nuts my parents went there a lot two years ago for a college visit for my sister they said it was a beautiful campus much like Indiana's Oregon's was mm-hmm. yeah I believe that I mean just because the I mean the area is so green in more ways than one um and it's, you know what I mean? But it's, I mean, it's, listen, the Oregon coast last year when I was out for the race in Portland, had free time. I went up to the area where they filmed the Goonies and, and I think it's Asbury. Is that the name of the town, Oregon? And it was, I mean, it was unbelievable. It's the Oregon coast is absolutely beautiful. Uh, J&B just walked in and he has done the unthinkable, which has managed to convince businesses in Terre Haute that Greg Rakestraw is also a sycamore, right? Yeah, they think that, don't they? They, they, they had a big sign that yeah. when you guys went to the game, w- welcome back, J&V and Rakestraw, right? It's not up, is it right? Hey, shut it down for a minute. All right. Yeah. Yeah, they think he went to Indiana State. Uh, pretty cool environment, though, right? Yes, it was awesome. It was good to see because so many years, 
you don't have anything like that. And, man, they love basketball over there. And uh, you give them some success. And I'm a big fan of Greg Lansing, too. We're still really good friends. But, uh, you know, he's better off moving to the direction which he is right now. And Josh has done a great right? job. He's at Arizona State with Bobby Hurley. I'm sure there's a little bit of chaos going on there because it's a Hurley. Yep. And it's not a great successful hurry hurley coaching wise so there's probably some chaos but yeah he's in a good spot there he's been a uh, a scout i think he was an area scout regional scout for philly before he took that gig um but no seriously josh shirts is having a great season my thing is i wonder how they're going to be with going six or seven deep in this Missouri Valley Conference, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's a long three days Arch right Madness, there. Arch Madness, baby. Yeah, I'm going to go the over, one thing about that league, Sunday if they John, win. the thing I've always said about that league is it's just a well-coached league. You know what I mean? I mean it is. You, any yeah. team you go in against, they're going to be prepared. They're well-coached. Um, well, look how much success the Big Ten's having with a lot of dudes that came from the Missouri Valley. I mean, De- De- Marcus Damask with Illinois, right. Southern Illinois, Lance Jones, Purdue, Southern Illinois. Who's that uh, – that, uh, European dude for Fred Hoiberg's team in Nebraska. Mast, is that his name? Yeah, he's from Bradley. They, they, I mean, there's a lot of of guys from the Mo Valley that Shh, helps other teams. Say that quietly because you don't want people coming and raiding the Sycamores for next year. Well, they're right? going that's going to happen. Here's the thing though. They've got it they've got guys in the kid from Pike, Conwell, has already transferred South Florida once. Um you got Swope who transfers to Southern Indiana. Right. So and I think if I think if Josh stays around, that they'll try to run it back next year. Better break because Eddie says so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get picks and we'll hand it off to John next. At Bet365, we don't do.
The Jay Cook Plays of the Day. This is me, all right? I'm not a athlete. This is my play. This is how I win. Jake, it is back. Conference Championship Week, a two-part series, begins today. The Atlantic Sun first round action begins. We'll take Kennesaw State on the money line over Jacksonville. Simultaneously with that game, we'll take FGCU on the money line over Queens of North Carolina. Those are our plays of the day. Wait, but what, what's what was the second school you said there? Well, it's just labeled as Queens, but Queens is in North Carolina, so we're going with FGCU. But I just wanted to give the proper distinction. This John, is not are Queens you in New York. Queens of North Carolina. This is Queens, North Carolina. <laughs> Is Queens Royals Charlotte? men's basketball. Yes, it is. Because uh, yep. it's Charlotte. the Queen City. Charlotte's like a Queen City that, that battles with Cincy, right? I knew That's that. Queen City. There you go. What What's their mascot? The Royals, I guess. Queens Royals. Okay. So uh, yesterday, I was at Holman Center, and the mayor of Terre Haute came over to talk to me. I thought that was you. And he said, hey, I'm the mayor of Terre Haute. And I thought he was joking because he looks 15. <laughs> I go, yeah, me too. I'm the mayor of Farmersburg. <laughs> He goes, no, I am. I go, you look like you're 12. So uh, I think I'm going to pronounce his last name inaccurately, and I'm sure I will. I'm known for that. Brandon uh, Sockman, I believe, is the. Uh, Sockman or Sockman? Sockman, S-A-K-B-U-N. Okay. He was born in 1996. He's the mayor of Terre Haute. He looks like he was born in 2006. He grew up in Terre Haute, I take it? I don't know. How many people live in Terre Haute? He was uh, in the army. Oh, I'd have to look and see. I'm not sure. Over a hundred. I'll go. Hundred thousand. I'll, uh, I'll say eighty-four thousand. I'll say, Jake, that's a good one right there. I'm going to take the under. If this is the price is right, I will go card under sharks? that. I'll, I'll, I'll bid a dollar. Are we doing card uh, sharks on this one? <laughs> I would say, say I'll say lower. I'll say seventy-three. Now are we going okay. metropolitan area or just uh? Uh oh, seventy-six for me. No. 76? Oh, yeah, you said 73. I'll go 76. No. That was in 2021, it's 58,000. Yeah, okay. Huh. I would have guessed it to be a little bit higher than that, obviously, as I just did. But. I had such a great time over there. I can always have a great How time over there. How was the crowd at the arena? It was, I mean, fantastic. Sold Better out? Than I've seen it forever. It was, if not sold out, was pretty damn close. So, good time. They're good, too. That Ryan Conwell from Pike. He saved them. I, I, I shouldn't say saved them, but he was the reason why they got out and, and got that win. He's been so good for them, transfer from South Florida. I've got to give uh, – I should have looked up. Bill Zick was over there watching. Bill Zick was the head coach at Pike when he was there. Now the head coach at Southport. I used to give him a really hard time. I needed to apologize to Bill Zick sometime. Did you watch any of the high school sectionals? Unbelievable finish at Garen. Did you see that? Um, Man, I, I saw crazy. the finish at Garen. Uh, obviously saw what happened in Noblesville with Noblesville and Fishers. And you know, five overtime with Orleans yep. and Bar Reef down in Ligoti. And tip of the cap, by the way, to Indianapolis, Washington. First yes. sectional title since 1995. Um you know, since I gave Steve Downing a ride the other day after jury duty, I'm obligated to be all in on Washington. Well, right? what's uh, the assistant coach? Used to be an assistant coach with Matt that's now over at Ohio State. Uh, Jack, uh, who am I thinking of right here? He was a part of that team, too. Wrong. <laughs> He's much older. But no, I mean, that's okay. I'm glad I'm, you jumped I'm in on that, Eddie. Right no, um, <clears throat> God dang it. Why can't I think of his name right now? That's crazy. You're talking about that, that went. With, yeah, there was a part of that Holman, 95 right? team that won a sectional. Remember they had – didn't they play Ben Davis in the yes, regional? Yes, that Hinkle? was one of the great games of all time. And it was like legendary. Correct. When they played. Great game. I mean, that was Owens? one of the great games of all time. Jack right? Owens, Jimmy. I do that, yeah. Jimmy gets a dollar. Yes. That was – those were – I mean, that, put that it on run State. was electric back in 95, right? I'm going to tell you, that game will go down in history as one of the greatest games. I think it was a sellout at Hinkle. That's correct. The sun was coming in. It was just – it was awesome. In that. It was a regional, too, back then. Um, Single class. What do you got lined up for the show? Do you got any concerns about Tyrese Halliburton? Oh, yeah. I got concerns all the way around here. And now I'm always going to have concerns. I got concerns about uh, him being worn out, him still being a bit injured. Um, I have concerns about Siakam and the cohesion with that. If it hasn't worked out, I have concerns. Nice cough, Jimmy. Um, I have concerns about um, Buddy Heald. And I, I know people are going to say, hey, it's not Buddy Heald. Listen, it's not all about making the shots. It's about creating space Correct. because you have to be tagged with your shot-making ability. And that is a thing. And plus, I think we all know what they've had in return for that deal. Jack Squat. 
from Doug McDermott, either injured or he's living in a van down like by any the of us trying to shoot it. So and yeah, he's hurt. He's been hurt, John. Yeah. Well, he wasn't hurt before he got hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Let the record show I pressed the cough button. Just want that on the, on the record. He, he stunk. I think they probably still got it in my microphone. I'm sitting on your lap right here, Jimmy. <laughs> so. All right. John's up next. Yeah. We will be back with you at noon tomorrow. Thanks for listening to Quarry and Company here on 93.5, 107.5 The Fan. The Ride with JMV. He is Dane Brugler of The Athletic. You do a look-see 